All right, we are live. This is Armin Navabi from Atheist Republic, and we are with... Um, I'm Anthony of Easter Bisson. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a writer for The Region and for RO Magazine. My main area of interview, my main topic I usually focus on is Syria and um, international conflict. I'm currently studying um, law and politics and international relations, and... Um, yeah, my specialty, if you will, is uh, Kurdish uh, issues uh, when in regards to Syria. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you know where I uh, where I found you. It was on uh, Nightmare Fuel's YouTube channel. Uh, I'm I, I I recently became a big fan of his, mostly because of his him uh, going after atheists that are religious apologists. And I, I mean, I was always against that, but I didn't know how big of an issue it is until he, I saw him talking about it and I found out how big of a plague it is. And I think um, I was very happy to see, I mean, I, I really admired the fact that he's one of the leading voices going after um, people within our own community, which make, I mean, I knew it was, a, I always saw it as a thing among many atheist ex-Muslims that were arguing for reform. So I knew it was a thing in our community, mm -hmm. but I didn't think, I didn't know it was such a big thing among ex-Christians that make, so, so that, that's why how, um, I became a big fan of his YouTube channel because of that. Uh, and you know, especially after Jordan Peterson came out, and um, I saw how many atheists became a fan of his work, uh, I found that that people like Nightmare Fuel Reese, uh, uh, he how valuable yeah. his work. Because I think he's one of the leading voices when it comes to looking at our own community and looking at atheists that are making excuses for religion. Uh, but but he also has a different so. On, almost on everything that I agree with him, and I um, I'm so happy that. He, his channel exists, and I think he, he, he needs to have more followers because of that, because he's one of the leading voices against that. But uh, another passion that he has is about uh, politics and U.S. intervention and the Middle East and geopolitics and that stuff. So because I'm, I'm a fan of th that kind of activism he does, um, I mean, I myself am Iranian and been following uh, Middle East politics a lot. Uh, but it was a happy accident that I saw he was also covering these topics, but he was covering it from a completely different perspective that I usually uh, focus on. So it was uh, it was interesting to see how somebody like him would view um, so, uh, the politics. And then when he invited, so I, I started watching those as well. And when he invited you, and I was very, uh, it was like, who is this guy? I need to, I need to talk to Anthony. <laughs> he's like, he's, he got this guy seems to know his shit. Um, so live chat, greetings, Beach. Uh, everything's working. Thank you, Jeremy, for confirming that. Uh, Shane, hello. Uh, Parpolization. How how do most Iranians view America? Okay, that's a very hard question. Um, I by the way. Um, I don't. Well, I will. I will tell you why that's a hard question. Uh, Peterson got crushed by Dillahanty. Yes, he did. Uh, go, if you want to watch that video, him being crushed, <laughs> go watch, go on the uh, Pangbear's Philosophies Patreon account. They have it there. Um, but this is not the topic today. Hi everyone. Hi Mike. All right. So today we're going to talk about uh, U.S. intervention in the Middle East, uh, and, and so. And basically talk about di from different perspectives, and I'm going to try to play the devil's advocate mm -hmm. as much as possible. And I, this as, it's always the, very dangerous when you do that because people can take the clips out <laughs> and tell, the, <laughs> like, "Oh, look, Armin is from Iran, and he's he's uh, he's supporting the Islamic regime because he's from there." But a hypocrite, right? He's for human rights and stuff, and unless it's about his own country. But what they like, you know, even when people don't play, are not playing devil's advocate, they quote, you know, they do that to them. They edit it to make it sound like that. So it's make you're making their job much easier when you when you're actually giving them full paragraphs of arguments in a position that you might not even support. But anyways, what I have to say that um, comment that um, a lot of the things I might say here today is going to be devil's advocate. So, um, but but so what are you, so right now this topic on U.S. intervention 
um, is um, and in general, um, most is being most uh, is being more focused on mainly uh, North Korea and Iran right now these days, right? Uh, well, North Korea is is not mainly our focus here, except when it comes to the influence of that deal um, on Iran's nuclear deal, right? Whatever uh, the actions on that take, but because because one of the main focuses right now is on Iran. We, I thought we could, I mean, you also mentioned that in the private chat that maybe we could start with Iran and then go from there, right? Um, and when it comes to U.S.-Iran uh, relationship, the main focus right now is the uh, nuclear deal and what Trump is going to do in the next two weeks or so and whether it was a good idea, it was a bad idea, should we throw it away? What happens if we throw it away? Uh, there's so many questions that we can ask, I don't even know where to start, right? Um, what what do you think? What do we do? You want to address that, or what 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 what's the best way if we, if you think well, we can start? Yeah, I sort of like touch on the nuclear deal a bit uh, because it's not my level of focus usually. Right. But um, when it comes to the whole Iranian nuclear deal that Obama set up in 2015, the idea was to deter Iran from gaining the possession of a nuclear bomb or the creation of a nuclear bomb. Because obvious, for obvious reasons, having a huge um, anti-Western power in the Middle East possessing a nuclear bomb is not only a threat for um, U.S. national interests, but also a threat for Iran in general. Because if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, it can use that nuclear weapon as, if you will, a bargaining chip or a me method of um, tyranny for neighbors around it. And it'll use that bomb most likely against Israel, if it could. But this is, of course, um, so when it comes to the Iran nuclear deal, the whole idea was to lax, if you will, sort of relax um, sanctions on Iran in exchange for inspectors to come in and check and monitor any type of um, nuclear activity by the Iranian government. But the problem with that is the Iranian government has been lying about its end, even though it keeps denying that it's the US who has not maintained its part of the deal. But um, the whole point of the nuclear deal from Obama's side was to try, give an avenue for the regime to relax its nuclear program, while at the same time maintaining a bit of uh, strength for the United States' end and other of the Western end. So the idea is to sort of prevent the creation of a nuclear bomb from the Iranian deal. However, the reason why I guess I either wanted to be modified or um, essentially scrapped is because it's not working because you can't appease tyranny, especially the Iranian regime as it currently stands. Um, what if the, what about the people that say without the nuclear deal, Iran, uh, there's nothing that will stop Iran from getting a nuclear deal. In fact, it, the, the, in fact, without it, you will actually giving them gr the green light. It's a it's it's going to be a win-win uh, for the hardliners because um, they're going to show that it was it wasn't them that moved out of the deal it was the U.S. So they will be able to use that as a way to keep relationship with other countries except U.S. And and without the deal, they will have the relationship with other countries. And at the same time, they could move forward with the uh, with getting the nuclear um, the, the nuclear capabilities. And again, when when they they claim to they it seems like they they claim that they never wanted a nuclear weapon. Uh, that's a, their claim, and even with or without the deal, they just wanted nuclear energy. Um, and just recently, who was this guy? Uh, Pompeo, right? Yeah, Mike Pompeo. Yeah, he also mentioned that. Um, in car he mentioned that he doesn't think that they ever wanted the nu nuclear weapon, um, or before or after the deal. But just recently, Netanyahu came out with some. Mm -hmm. Lots of copies of CDs and papers that show that they are going for the. One thing that is very complicated about this is that when people talk about Iran, they 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 seem to talk about just one entity, uh, but there's there there all there are a lot of competing forces in Iran. I think, and it's hard to sometimes tell which ones have the upper hand, um, and. Another thing that I think that a lot of people make a mistake is when they're looking at these very religious uh, uh, governments, they assume that they're insane. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that if you look, if you try to analyze their actions, 
that they're they're not moral but not insane right it seems like a lot of their stuff strategically a lot of the stuff that they do sometimes is more explainable when you don't assume that they're just like they have this end world um ideology i mean it, it seems like it from outside a lot of times it seems like they do but I do think that, and sometimes when I say these, these whatever the things that Iran is doing seems to be more strategic than people suggest. People think that I'm saying that it's a good; they're doing the right thing. Saying that they're not insane does not mean that they are. It's the, they're being moral with what the decisions that they're making. But but what what? How do you respond to that? The fact that if you, I mean. The main one of the 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 main groups in Iran that would love it that if the nuclear deal gets uh, if the deal uh, gets thrown out are the hardliners in Iran, um, and people would be like, shouldn't shouldn't that give us a pause that basically we're doing exactly what the hardliners in Iran want to happen? Now, as again, uh, my I guess area of interest is not really focused on the nuclear deal, but if I were to address those uh, critiques, if you will. Uh, that um, I understand that Iran is a very logical actor, even though it may not be the most uh, moral actor in the region, it still has logic behind its actions, and that cannot be denied, especially what it does in Iraq and Syria and other places as well. But it also cannot be denied that um, there is an ideological underpinning that does motivate a lot of the actions from especially the Ayatollahs and the ruling class. Because yes, I know that there's different um, sects within the region, sorry, the regime, you know, marry in their uh, outlooks and that, but um, there is an essence that there's an anti-Western and uh, sort of an anti-Israel, especially uh, ideological underpinning to a lot of these policies that they do. I know that it's not just rhet rhetorically speaking, but it's also in actions as well, because what the IRGC does in Syria and Iraq, and what they do when providing weapons to Hezbollah and other areas near in Yemen and so on and so forth, there's always this sort of like this anti-Western, sort of anti-quote-unquote Zionist um, uh, sort of uh, motivator. So I yeah, guess... I mean, I, yeah. yeah, sorry. Go on. Yeah. Either. No, I mean he. The thing when it comes to religious fanatics in the Middle East, there's I think there's two types. The ones that are the religious, the religion is the goal, mm -hmm. and the ones that the religion is the tool, right? That's, that's and that's and I think and I think the ones that religion is the goal, they don't last long, because they're they're uh, because you know. They're so insane that they're not being very strategic. Like ISIS, for example, right? Yeah. Um, they come and go. But the one that religion is the tool seem to have a different goal. Not that religion it doesn't have a destructive force. It's not a destructive force. It is a destructive force. But they're using it more as a weapon rather than an end goal. And um, one thing that, for example, a lot of people... For example, Iran has managed to use its Shia influence all across the Middle East. Um, and it's not because these people have a hard on for spreading Shia th Shiism. It's mostly because Shiism is a great tool, good base to get Iranian support and use that Iranian support to in in increase your influence around the Middle East. And a lot, so. And again, when it comes to anti-Israel, a lot of people think, like say that, oh, Iran wants to destroy Israel. I, I honestly think that they would, they would love Israel to always be there as an excuse to get anti-Israel support. You know what I mean? Like, it's such a... Yeah, I mean, they don't, ne they never want Israel to go away. I don't think even Hamas wants Israel to go away. Hezbollah, I mean, without Israel, Hezbollah would lose all this funding, right? Uh, and Hamas would lose all this funding. Um, I think that, um, especially now when Saudi Arabia seems to be playing footsies with Israel, um, uh, Iran is such a, uh, is moving in and if, filling the void to remind everybody that they're the only Islamic force that has always stood against uh, the, the Zionists and the great devil and the small devil, right? The, because I think uh, the, Iran plays the PR, uh, its PR strategy among Muslim 
fanatics in the around the Middle East very very well. Um, and you know, n this is not to say that there are not there are many powerful forces in Iran that are are, are uh, have wet dreams over seeing one day Israel fall and them capturing Jerusalem for sure. But I think there are very religious pragmatic um, influencers in Iran that will basically just keep saying one day we're going to destroy Israel. Uh, and it's just basically, I'm not just, I'm not saying this is, I'm not excusing it, by the way, when I say this, people think that I'm saying like, oh, we shouldn't take it seriously. Uh, no, no, we should take it seriously, right? But I'm just saying this is just basically uh, like a drums of war, like just basically, I mean, it's it's pretty insane. Like the main the main uh, force, um, foreign, foreign force in Iran, which is the Quds, uh, army, right? Which is basically take kind of like Iran's CIA, and with, with if Iran, if United States CIA had more ground uh, troops, uh, but um, the name Quds is Jerusalem, right? Imagine if, for example, the CIA was named after Tehran, <laughs> right? That was <laughs> that would that would be that would be very scary for Iran, but but but. But even though that's the case, I do think that it's a lot. Uh, it could be used most as a as a way to gain support. But at the same time, you can't get that support if you don't actually sh show that you are you mean it, right? And I think because of that, because of that advocacy for one day Israel being captured and destroyed, there are a lot of people in Iran that are waiting for that to happen in their lifetime, right? Not that that's not the case, right? Um, I mean, even since since the Iraq War, Iran Iraq War, many of the songs w was that today will capture Karbala, tomorrow Jerusalem, something like that, right? Like the goal of the Islamic Revolution was not to end in Iran. It wasn't supposed to. Khomeini didn't it was see the, to Yeah, yeah, exactly. Iran, Khomeini didn't see the Iranian Revolution as an Iranian revolution. It was it, he didn't hate he hated nationalism right he hated for he did it was supposed to be an Islamic revolution and he actually was very he died very upset about the fact that the Iran Iraq war ended and they didn't go all the way to Karbala and everything right so I think this is but now the the new governments after Khomeini they learned that you don't actually need to spend a lot of money to get into these countries all you have to do is just gain ground support and then get elected into these places, right? Yeah. And this is why <laughs> so they like when and then they this is why I'm also this is something that I think Greece would disagree with me. I think basically United States attack in removing Saddam was they basically gift wrapped Iraq and gave it to Iran uh, by doing that. What do you think? I would agree in part because I do agree that the United States' um, long-term strategy within Iraq didn't address the Iranian influence that was on its border, if you will, sorry, you know, around the corner, if you will. But um, I don't think that um, it's that leaving Saddam Hussein necessarily there would have made anything particularly better because regardless of um, when a Saddam would go or not, Saddam was going to go, whether by his own people or whether by U.S. intervention. It was just that time, and whatever happened afterwards, Iran would have stepped in anyway. But I do agree that the America, especially the United States, should have addressed the influence of the Iranian presence there. Because I know that um, I have a couple friends whose parents were um, sort of Kurdish friends, I mean, in um, areas like Bashar, which is Iraqi Kurdistan who have um, family members who are ambassadors to the United States, and um, they mentioned to, you know, the Bush administration at the time of the Iranian presence there. But the Bush administration didn't take it as serious as the Kurdish, especially the Kurds in the North, wanted to take the Iranian presence seriously as. So they... The, the, sorry, go, go. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say that, um, so I do agree that the United States didn't actually do enough to address that whole Iranian um, sweeping in to the vacuum fuel. I mean, they had swept in ages ago. They had, this is what mm -hmm. something Iran does very well is that they, um, they invest a lot, in, a lot in getting ground support. They invest long term. And I think like one thing that 
this is why sometimes I'm a little bit uh, impressed in a, in a, not that it's a good thing by the amount of long-term thinking that sometimes Iran has when it comes to uh, their foreign policy. It seems like Israel, United States, and especially Saudi Arabia, they have short-term uh, solutions to things. Uh, Saudi Arabia seems to take some takes reactions without even thinking. Every single uh, every single measure they took against Iran made Iran stronger. Uh, but they seem to have like short term um, planning. I mean, but Iran seems to have like ten years, five years, you know, down the road they plan every. I mean, when when um, when Saddam fell, Iran had spent years of worth of uh, spreading their networks and influence in in Iraq. That's not something you could undo um, over overnight. That if United States was having a longer term plan, if they wanted to remove Saddam, they should have addressed that like years ago. Like you can't just you know I don't. I mean, and, and, and another thing, yes, I agree that uh, obviously Saddam was a fucking monster. Um, and, but the thing is that the question is not whether these people deserve to be removed. The question is what's the best strategy, you know, not, you know, what's it, you know, a lot of people think, I mean, I'm not against intervention. I'm against bad intervention, like not very well planned intervention. Right. And it's not that, it's not that I think that the United States is, um, doesn't have obviously <laughs> it's the most powerful country in the world they have the capacity to make these uh plans the thing is that it seems the interest groups that sometimes are behind these interventions their goal again this is this is why i always say if you assume people are smart everything makes sense because if the the goal of the people behind the decisions sometimes are not necessarily united states the the best interest of United States taxpayer is not in mind, right? So even if you are pro intervention, uh, which I am pro good intervention, I don't think that I, if I was a U.S. taxpayer, I would be worried that the amount of influence some specific group have on people that make these intervention decisions uh, compared to how much the actually ta U.S. taxpayer is being. Uh, taken into account. Like, I think the amount of influence that Saudi Arabia has in the United States um, and, you know, Israel and groups, very questionable groups like um, MEK, Mujahideen Khal, mm -hmm. right? The, uh, these are, I mean, if, if, imagine United States right now, uh, John B Bolton and other people are, you know, in bed with organizations like Mujahideen Khalq as if they are a serious opposition to Iranian government. And anybody that knows anything about Iran knows that the only group of people that are hated more than the mullahs in Iran are, the, M are the MEK. And these people would not have a, any, any chance for any amount, for any traction in Iran as a, as a main source of opposition. And when I see that major US, uh, U.S. decision makers so high up are actually considering these people as the main opposition to Iranian government. And like, okay, this seems like this, this seems like the people don't, either they don't understand what the hell's going on or they don't care, right? Um, uh, yeah, go I on. just want to suggest that um, when it comes to that point, I do agree with you that long-term strategy is important, especially if you're going into a region and asking a tyrant. It's important. For example, I supported, um, well, you know, in retrospect, I support uh, the the ousting of Saddam Hussein, for example, that was good and necessary. However, I have to agree with the critics on when it comes to long-term strategy, because the United States' long-term strategy was it was not dedicated enough to rebuilding the country, and it's still for lesser extent. It's fine to keep this federal project afloat in Iraq, even though there's still that huge presence of Hashd al Shabi and other groups. But I agree that, you know, I don't, this is what um, I guess differs me from other neocons and sort of, sorry, neoconservatives and that is that I'm an internationalist. I 
support, if you will, those groups fighting tyranny and that, regardless of their states. I'm not in support of, um, if you will, the old Cold War policy of Henry Kissinger, where it was, you know, you prop up um, fascist regimes or regimes that are anti-communist. They don't have to be democratic, anti-communist to oppose the communist bloc, if you will. And it's almost like a similar strategy that I hear from people like Bolton and uh, Lester. I've not heard much from Pompeo yet, to be honest. But the thing is with Bolton and that um, I'm a bit worried that he, you know, he rhetorically, you know, he's a supporter, for example, of the Kurds and that, but he would rather invest, if you will, in like things like Saudi Arabia and Turkey, who are themselves dictatorial countries, in order to counter Iran without having necessarily any concern for the ground. That's a very bad position because that reminds me of a bit of the Cold War. We have, you know, you're just supporting um, one anti um, uh, Iranian. You know, block in this case, we anti communist block or you know, anti Iranian block against the Iranian block, and you sort of um, you make it stability, quote unquote, stability and status quo in the region by maintaining this sort of this power balance, which I think is a, a terrible strategy because at the end of the day, you need to support the locals, you need to support the people of Iran or the people of Syria, and that not the Islamists necessarily, just making that sorry, the little um, uh, asterisks on that point, if you will. It's just the people who are. So who want to fight this tyranny and who want uh, their rights and their freedoms and so on. And unfortunately, a lot of the state actors, if you will, they don't support that at times. They don't support those non-state actors. They only support those non-state actors that are Western sympathetic, which is a good and a bad thing. It's a good thing, I guess, if you want to maintain the the hegemony of Western powers and that, in which is in many respects, uh, in my mind, it's sort of a positive thing because, you know, in comparison to other regimes and that the West has some good points and those other regimes not so good. So but from that perspective, but on another perspective, it's also denies local agency at times, which is a very a big thing that needs to be addressed. If you yeah, I mean, if, when you do that, the problem is that you're you're making a you're investing in a small uh, short-term solution rather than a long-term solution because by doing that you will lose ground you will lose ground support and I think a lot of people underestimate how important ground support is yeah. um, and this is why I think it's not what about is them when we mention that United States is eight when United States is aiding Saudi Arabia in their war against Yemen, which is which is right now the greatest humanitarian crisis in 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 our lifetime right now, when when the United States is actually actively you know, literally fueling Saudi planes in mid air while they go and drop bombs on innocent people and then come back and the United States fuels them back, um, and when the United States against its own, I think arguably against its own constitution. Funds uh, uh, sells weapons to a regime that is killing innocent uh, innocent people, in, in, including many children. The people say, like when when they when the United States goes into war against, um, um, when the United States goes to war against, for example, Syria, and they say this is for humanitarian reasons. The reason why this is not what about is because nobody is going to underground is going to take you seriously as a force for upholding human rights if you're mm -hmm. actually actively involved in bombing uh, Yemeni uh, civilians, right? It's not. It's not that. It's not that this. Um, you sh oh, you shouldn't save people from Assad. Because of this, if if that was the argument that you shouldn't bomb Syria because um, you're you know because of this because you're also doing this, that's what about is it right? But the, that's not the argument. The argument is that your intentions doesn't seem to be what you say your intentions are. Because if you did care about human rights, the easiest thing you could do. Is to stop supporting Saudi Arabia in the war against against Yemen, right? I mean, this is something uh, I both. Yeah, go on. Sorry about that. Um, just um, if I were to play a bit of devil's advocate on that point, um, a lot of the policy makers they first have national security in mind, which is under it's understandable from if you will from a maintaining the status quo, maintaining the security of the state. But for people who support, like you know. Um, international human law, sorry, international humanitarian law, human rights, it's a very, I get frustrated as well, like for example, when I see the um, United States sort of apologizing, you know, playing a 
apolog sorry, apologetics for Turkey or playing apologetics for um, Saudi Arabia, I do, I do get frustrated. But there's another part of me that understands why, because they're trying to maintain this of your this power balance. But I don't like the way those things are run. You know, it's like you know, I understand the rules of the game. But I don't like those rules. But the thing is that those 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 um, I don't under, I mean it seems like they're working, but and I, I think long term they're not they don't work, right? Because I mean I think this is why I'm thinking if you're thinking ten years, uh, twenty years, these things don't work. I mean United States as a force for intervention or as a force for good after World War II, they had a really good image, right? Um, and I mean the. This is why this is why um, Iran gets invited to intervene in these countries, right? Iran sa Iran says like, hey, what the uh, United States is coming? So their their point is that you're coming all the way from another continent and you're intervening in these countries that are our neighbors without the permission of the government, which is itself against international laws. We are these countries are our neighbors, and we're intervening because we were invited to intervene by the official governments of the of these governments, and then you have the audacity to tell us that we shouldn't be intervening. That's what that's how they this is what they will say, right? Yeah. They say that these are in when we're in Iraq, we're invited in Iraq by the democratically elected government of this country. Right. And people like when they people blame Obama for leaving Iraq, um, I ask them, how could Obama stay? Iran made Iraq re resend their invitation to United States. How could United States stay in Iraq? How could Obama have stayed in Iraq when the government, when the democratically elected government that they supported asked them to leave? Right. They couldn't have. Right. Um what are your thoughts on that? Uh, um, when it comes to that, um, uh, listen, I don't uh, support most of uh, Obama's foreign policy decisions. I think I've uh, made myself clear on a number of occasions of different podcasts on that. It's just to me that Obama lacked, if you will, that, um, yes, I understand that, um, because, you know, Obama's positions, especially on foreign policy, were quite reactionary to the Bush administration's decisions on foreign policy. Of course, that's for a good reason, because... Uh, went into Iraq and into Afghanistan and they still maintain a presence there today. But the thing with Obama is that um, the Obama administration tried its, if you will, to, how can I put this? It tried to be good, have a good image to the United States, sorry, to the United States public while having a uh, sort of a, a good image also to the Middle East and that. But again, the thing with Iran is that um, Iran's trying, if you will, to influence in the region through Iraq, through Syria, through Lebanon, and so on and so forth. And there's Iraqi Kurdistan, for example, which is a big um, sort of biggest benefit, if you will, of the United States' intervention into Iraq, both in the early 90s and then early 2000s as well, with the first Gulf War with the no-fly zone and then with the second Gulf War which is why a lot of, for example, a lot of Iraqi Kurds didn't want the United States because they viewed the, the presence, if you will, of um, a kind of fascism, if you will, from the Arab side coming in to Iraq Kurdistan again. And I understand, yes, um, from an international law perspective, yes, the uh, Iraqi government did ask um, the Obama administration to leave, and it did sort of leave slowly, but the Obama administration, if you will, it was going... Not if you will, sorry, I keep saying if you will, <laughs> was um, putting money also into local school developments and other infrastructure development were good. And I, I think those things should continue because ultimately the way you're going to defeat, if you will, the ideology of extremism in this, this region is to educate the populace with the basic skills of free thinking and so on. But at the moment, it's just from, you know, it's easy from an armchair perspective to do an analysis of um, US foreign policy making in places like Iraq. But if we had sort of looked into more sort of complex dimensions, it is very complicated. And I'm say that, um, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's why I've got nothing more to say on that point, sorry. No, yeah, I mean, it is, very, it is very complicated, but I, I mean, and I think that 
when I listen to Iranian propaganda, I I have to give it to them. They they know they are doing a very good job at um, selling their image. I mean, this is why I think that th this is the Iranian um, protests uh, was the great is the the Achilles heels for Iran because that's what because Iran needs its image to be to be able to Iran depends on selling its branding the Iranian version of Shiism Velayat Faqih to be able to spread its ideology because it needs its, it needs its ideology as a as a base as a foundation to then build its support on um so and I and that's why I think that its an image when it comes to the protests it is actually the greatest threats towards its control in the Middle East and that's the kind of intermediate I mean well I'll get to that but but right now they're what they're what they're the, the way that they are arguing is like look who Iran uh, it was United States when they came to Iraq they Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi came out of a US prison right um it, it, it was the United States that removed Saddam, and they created. They're responsible for creating ISIS, and and they say who defeated ISIS? Everybody, nobody provided ground troops. Nobody provided ground troops except Iran against ISIS. That's what they say. Okay, they say you can't win wars through air power. You have to have ground force, and nobody was willing to make that sacrifice against Iran, except Iran. And if Iran wasn't there to fight ISIS, ISIS was ISIS might have taken all over Baghdad by now, right? Um, th that's how. And and the the the, prob the thing is that the current uh, Iraqi government gives that credit to them, right? I mean, Tillerson when he was in Baghdad, he was embarrassed. In, on on t on on the news when he was telling them that these Iranians need to go back to Iran and you're like no these people <laughs> then the response was like no no these people are welcome here the Iraqi government was telling them these we, we owe these people everything right um, so Iran is like look you guys are coming here you you, you have no business here again this is people devil's advocate don't don't oh. right, right. <laughs> you have no business here. This is you're coming from across from a different continent. You're coming here. You're you're mess. You're you're breaking everything. We fix it, and then you tell us that we have no right to intervene. Who gave you the right to intervene? We are intervening in our neighbors. These are our allies. Syria is our ally. Iraq is our ally. Lebanon is our ally. We are helping them clean up the mess you created, and you're telling us not to intervene. So I mean, it's a I mean. You have to give it to them. They are when people listen to that on the ground, they they are they do a lot of people in Iraq. They do. I mean, there's so much hate for Iran in the ground, and there's also so much love for Iran in the ground, right? There are people in Syria and in Iraq that can, um, that would die for killing Khamenei and die for you know spreading his ideology at the same time like that's the amount the, the number of this is something i was so shocked about the number of people that are willing to die for the vilayat faqih in iran that are not even fucking iranian outside of iran this is how influential this is something that saudi arabia tried to do with wahhabism but they were it, it became a frankenstein monster that came back to haunt them because they never managed to get a control on it but iran managed to do that with spreading shiism and hezbollah they have a full. They have a leash, and they have a full control over that. You know, it's this. You, Khamenei, Khamenei's control over this ideology is a lot more centralized than any other Islamic force anywhere. Right? Any if there was anything close to a pope in Islam, it would be Khamenei's influence on sh the vilayat faqi branch of Shiism. Yes. It, I mean, I can't. I, I have to. I do actually agree with you because um, Iran has good marketing yeah. ability, especially marketing ability when it comes to their religious fanaticism and religious ideology. That in Syria, especially, a lot of there's a lot of Iranian paramilitaries who um, not only support, for example, um, the Iranian regime, but also support people like Qasem Soleimani. You know, these sort of these um, white, these silver foxes, if you will, of um, the military in that um, because Qasem Soleimani, if I remember, he's the Quds commander, commander of the yeah. IRGC. Oh, yeah. he's considered a fucking hero. Among yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. Yeah. Silver Fox. <laughs> Sorry. Go. Yeah. No. It, it, the interesting thing is that you know, religion in Iran separates people, but nationalism mm -hmm. unites them, right? So yeah, the the thing that managed to get when it comes to religious control and Islam, then you have like a split between the Iranians where they hate, you know, a lot of them hate the religious establishment. But when it comes to national interests and oh, we should also have nuclear power and oh, we're we we are now our country is getting stronger. One thing that this, this government has realized is that the, the hatred for Arabs and Arab influence is something that the, both the religious and non-religious in Iran can get behind, right? And actually, it's Musgal mm -hmm. pointed out this in the live chat that uh, Ayatollah Khamenei mentions um, uh, that the Americans are trying to put Saudi in, uh, in the... Uh, make them a regional power rather than Iran. And I think Iranian, the Iranian government used to always be focused their hate because you always you always have these external enemies that you blame everything on, right? Mm -hmm. And historically, it was first it was I think Saddam, then it was uh, Salman Rushdie, and then it was, the focus was on Israel and United States. But but now I think the main unifying factor in Iran as the main enemy for Iran is being Saudi Arabia more than more than Israel and United States because that's something that both the liberals and the conservatives can can get behind, right? So this is a very useful and Saudi Arabia is a very, very useful enemy for Iran, right? Um and you know and everything and and Saudi Arabia is is fucking scared of Iran right now. The the only thing this is why they're put they're now getting close to the, Israel. This is the. This is why people are shocked. Like, wow, Arabs and uh, Jews are working together. The only the only thing that managed to get Arabs and Jew, uh, Jews work with each other is their hatred for Shias, right? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's pretty true. Like the reason why you have um, Saudi Arabia and Iran being sorry, sorry, Saudi Arabia and Israel becoming much closer since 2014 is because of the Iranians' expansion. It's made both of them say, okay, guys, you know, we may hate the shit out of each other, but, you know, let's join together and just go from back uh, far away. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, to, 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 the, to, to be fair to them, Iran is building an uh, empire, the Shia, the Shia Crescent, right? I mean... Yeah. I mean, but the thing is that a lot of it was because of their long-term strategic thinking, but a lot of it was handed to them. Uh, Iraq was handed to them. Um, I mean, Yemen was not a major Iranian ally until Saudi Arabia decided to uh, make them a major Iranian ally. Uh, Qatar was just a little bit, you know, a little bit close to Iran, but now they're becoming buddy buddies because Saudi Arabia pushed them to Iran. Uh, Turkey is becoming a mate more of an ally yeah. to Iran because they push Turkey to Iran. Like everything they do against Iran seems to backfire on them. I mean, they, they thought that they could start a civil war in Lebanon by kidnapping the prime minister uh, and <laughs> making him resign. The Hariri, that was fuck, that was a fucking disaster. Like these people are not even thinking. The, the, I mean, the, it had the exact opposite effect of, the, of what they wanted. They wanted to get people in Lebanon started uh, uh, hating the Hezbollah and Iranian influence, but Hezbollah played it so well. They came out and instead of um, attacking Hariri, they say like, hey, that's, uh, we don't care that he's Sunni. He's our prime minister. Give our prime minister back. And the Sunnis, for the, the Sunnis supported that and people were so shocked at how much, because Sunnis in, in Lebanon are usually against Hezbollah and their influence. This was the first time, like, yes, unity, Lebanon. Once you know, when it comes to Saudi Arabia intervening, we're all living, you know, we're all together, right? And like, you know, instead of getting instead of all getting united against Hezbollah, they managed a backfire and they all got united against Saudi Arabia, which was such a major backfire for them, right? The uh, Qatar did not work. Qatar is now more power because the, the amount of re economic reforms that were slowly taking place in Qatar went on high speed 
after the block because they Qatar realized how much it's important to have relationship with other countries, right? And now Qatar is more independent from the other Arabs than ever, and it's be is becoming a more of it closer to uh, that backfired. Yemen fucking backfired. Uh, if Iran yeah. had. Yeah, oh my god, like they thought that's gonna be a two month war. Iran is like fucking loving. Iran claims to be worried about the human rights violations in Yemen, but they're fucking loving it. They just just poke their their influence in Yemen is so minimal and they just poke a little bit every once in a while and they force Saudi Arabia to waste dump billions of dollars in, in Yemen. And because their ego is so high, they're not willing to just pack home and pack it up and go home because they don't want to admit defeat. And this is a war that they can't win. And think about it. These are compare Iran with Saudi Arabia. Iran managed to defeat so many armies of ISIS, so many battles of ISIS. Iran just crushed ISIS. But Saudi Arabia, with all the billions of dollars that they got from the United States, they can't they can't defeat it's been three years. They can't defeat a bunch of people that don't even have shoes for crying out. They're wearing slippers, right? Like how they're they're one of the greatest armies in the Middle East and they have they don't have the talent and understanding how to defeat a bunch of Houthis. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, when it comes to the Yemen war, I mean, um, Bin Salman's intervention in 2015 on the side of, um, I guess, the strong government that it wanted, it's, you know, it's just been, I admit, it's been a human right catastrophe. And the, the reason why um, Saudi Arabia still persists in this is because the Houthi rebels keep firing, you know, Houthi rebels backed by Iran keep firing missiles at Riyadh, I think that's how you say it, and other areas within Saudi Arabia, which is why it keeps, Saudi Arabia keeps investing so much into it. But I agree, the whole war over there, the fact that the war was to try and maintain a strong Saudi positive uh, government in Yemen, as opposed to an Iranian, you know, in the area which it's sort of failed and when it comes to syria i mean when it comes to syria it backed if you will the islamists of um there is of the opposition as well against the side government especially when iran intervened in 2012 and in iraq it's sort of the gulf countries have invested a lot into um especially u.s backed projects as reconstruction that which is a a good Thing. But I agree that um, Saudi Arabia's strategy, if it compares to Iran, um, Iran's very clever. It's a genius when it comes to um, was when it comes to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia sort of relies wholly on the United States lead and other sort of Gulf partners. Yes, it, they want. To, it's, it's almost like um, the United States wants Saudi Arabia to be, if you will, the Gulf leader. But Saudi Arabia is not the leading country, if you will. It's not got that um, you know power yeah. and cleverness to do that. I mean, it's a really bad, uh, bad bet long term because a lot of people think Saudi Arabia is going to be an uh, oil importer by two, th but in the next twenty years, that's how yeah. bad situations are. And this is the this is the main ally you want to bank on. Um, I mean, I think the only thing Saudi Arabia has been very successful at is their lobbying of United States. Same with uh, same with Israel. Um, because I mean that's a very clever move because they don't they know they they don't want to go war into war with Iran. They just want someone else to uh, they want U.S. taxpayers to pay the bill for the war <laughs> instead of themselves because they can't afford it themselves. I mean Israel couldn't even defeat Hezbollah uh, a couple of years ago, which was a fraction well, of how powerful Hezbollah is today. Um, well, I wouldn't put um, saying this with all the positive things we keep saying <laughs> about Ron and you know devil's advocate in that, but yeah. um, we mustn't um, doubt sort of the power of um, Israel and um, other countries, especially the United States, because Israel provides a lot of intelligence for the United States. Israel has a oh, huge yeah. It's it's. I mean, I know the lobby groups, and you know, in democratic countries, the best way to get um, people on your side lobby that's how it usually works in democratic countries in non-democratic countries it's easy you have a central government who sort of controls most of everything and you know the resources can be invested anyway so it chooses but in countries like the united states which is i think a good and a bad thing it's a good thing that it has a democratic state you know where the people elect their leaders and that but it's also bad in terms of foreign policy making because foreign policy making is then entirely shifted towards okay we need to keep public opinion this way, okay, we will invest in that, then we'll withdraw. We'll invest right. in that, then we'll withdraw. You know, it's it's a problematic. Right. This is this is why this is why Iran is able to have a much more major commitment. That I mean, Israel is obviously way more 
um, advanced when it comes to military is just can't have the commitment that Iran has because it's a democracy and Iran is a fake democracy and it could basically invest as much as it wants and commit as much as it wants into all of these foreign um, interventions, right? It doesn't have to worry about, I mean, it does have to worry about right now, I, I mean, a little bit because of the protest, one of the main chance in the protest was that why are you spending all our money in foreign countries, right? Um, yeah. But but it doesn't have to worry about it as much as countries like United States or, or um, Israel have to. But, um, and, and I mean, this, the, so, I mean, when it, especially when it comes to intelligence, uh, Israel, nobody, nobody does it as, as good as uh, Israel, right? When it comes to and covert operations, right? Um, it's very good at what it does. I mean, the most of the intelligence, like the stuff that America gets, usually comes from Israel when it comes to intelligence because they've got agents, they've got um, huge networks, and it's very sophisticated because the Israelis invest a lot in their intelligence network, which is a good thing because it is also sort of a military state, even though it has like a conservative government with Beth, Benjamin Netanyahu in power. It's, it's very militaristically strong because it's always had to be because it has external threats around it. It's always been built like that. You know? but, it, but Israel also always knew that it can't, it can't afford to always go to war with its enemies. That's why yeah. it was always was very strategic about going in before things get to, to an outright war. I mean, right now they're bombing uh, strategic places, uh, Iranian influence in Syria. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, so... But... Uh, and at this, I mean, but but again, when it comes to, um, I mean, Israel, Israel is really afraid, and it should be afraid when of Iran because think about Iran. Like, okay, when they when they managed to uh, get Iraq, and now they're so influential in, in Iraq, and Iran. Is, uh, I mean, and think if you, I mean, if you are the government of Iraq, you obviously, if you had to choose between. Which ally uh, you would talk to, which, which you would follow more? Mm -hmm. That it, you will always pick Iran over the United States. United States is there and it's just gone, right? Iran is always going to be your neighbor. They have so many powerful institutions in uh, in Iraq. They're always going to be be able to raise armies from nothing in there, right? Uh, that's the people you have to listen to, right? So uh, they had they got Iraq. Uh, they had Lebanon since uh, since uh, early after the revolution. Hezbollah became more and more powerful, and that now it become political party there. So they're just in the government in Lebanon. And then with Syria, this is why this is why um, Israel is so sensitive about Syria, because if Syria, when if Assad stays and becomes stable. This is why Israel and the United States and Saudi Arabia they don't want the war in Syria to end because if the, if every all the chips fall where they are and Assad is in power and the war the war ends that means Iran is now in control of Syria right and now what you have is right from the borders of Iran with these countries right through all these three countries you have direct land route from Iran to the borders of Israel and that is something that Israel like no, never, no, 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 that's not, uh, that's not uh, gonna happen, that's not gonna happen, right? So. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing with the, when it comes to Syria is that, you know, of course, um, it's not that the United States doesn't want the war to end it necessarily, but it knows that that consequence of Assad winning the war, regardless, even though Assad technically is now like a puppet, like, you know, Iran has his hands far up his ass kind of thing to keep him steady there, um, you know, they know that um, the consequence of um, the war ending Al-Assad is the strong presence of Iran. Even though Iran had been using, if you will, Syria prior to the war as, if you will, um, a line of support towards Hezbollah against Israel. And that. But still the fact of the matter is that um, they never, Israel... They never had a land route directly. Of course, they never, had the, they never had the land route and that, but yeah. it's sort of this... this the sphere of influence if you will, in the region, Israel's very scared of that because they're afraid that you know um, Iran's going to build like, nuclear reactors or you know build weapons in the Golan Heights. Because you know Iran did, sorry, Israel did occupy the Golan Heights and still has occupied the Golan Heights ever since. Um, what is it? Uh, I don't know what war it was, Yom Kippur or some war. I've got where it is, but um, it's still always been sort of held on to the Golan Heights and that and. The fact that Iran's moving its presence more and more into Syria is a very worrying thing for Israel. 
um, yeah, and 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 I think like if, if people might ask, okay, if you think that Iran is not planning to eventually invade Israel, because I think that would be that. I mean, that Iran is not suicidal. I mean, come on, right? Um, I I just think they want to keep poking at Israel, and they want Israel to poke back so that they could spend. Uh, I, I, by the way, when you said that you think you don't think the United States wants these wars to continue, but w- again, when you look at the United States, you can't look at just the United States as one entity, right? And I do I think that the don't you think the weapon industry that w- as a major lobbying force uh, that has a lot of influence on the on that uh, and its interest is for these wars to keep continuing? And I mean, that's it- very. That's very um sort of like this uh, bit of a conspiratorial kind of it leads is it, towards is it really, bit. Is it really consp- uh, like do, is that is that too much of a stretch to I mean this I'm not saying that as if they're like the the thing is that this is not something that to suggest they are these are evil because these are not people. This this is a machine, this is an industrial, you know you know conflict. things yeah, military company. It's not you can't assign morality to it. People are like, oh, why are these um, industries so evil? And like, yeah, they're not human. Things just work because they work, right? Uh, it's expected. The re- and again, when when they, when United States is being or other countries are being humanistic, uh, fighting for humanitarian values, it's not because the government of the any of these countries is humanitarian. That's the nature of this government is to look at the interest groups and whatever interest group has influence on it, it will just follow those interest groups more, right? And I think the reason why many countries do um, fight for humanitarian values is because a lot of the interest groups, the human rights interest groups in those countries are more influential in those countries like than a country like in Saudi Arabia or, or, or even in Russia or in China, right? So... It's not like it's not that United States government or any other government has a heart or something that thinks like oh we have to. it's just and this is not this is not a criticism this is just the nature of things mm-hmm. the government just is influenced by interest groups and some countries human rights groups are more powerful interest groups compared to other countries right um, so but but just beca- and because of that, I do think that these um, do, do you think it's too much of a conspiracy theory to think that um, the weapon uh, industry uh, has an influence on the way that the, the United States makes decisions and well, interests are aligned with making sure not outright wars happen because they don't want the you know that goes. This proxy wars happening is always continuing. It's always in their best interest. Well, I would say that you know maybe there's a little bit of a factor of that, but I wouldn't say it's sort of like a huge factor because you must remember that in places like Syria and Iraq, you have the Department of Defense that does get a budget for spending on, if you will, um, military equipment here and there, and sort of defense side for national security interests. And that now I don't say I'm not naive in saying that uh, the United States has the best things in heart that you know it's love this and blah 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 but it's i do think that same sort of the weapon industry making a profit and kind of thing I, it's not the sole reason that i'm sure that they get benefit from it but you know right. there's other factors that go in. it's a very complicated niche of things maybe to make it to yeah, cop yeah, out of course yeah. you know what i'm not saying they're the uh, only influence i'm just saying when i see an organization like mech like mek um, is managed such a questionable organization is managing to have the ears of Bal- uh, like someone like John Balta. I, 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 uh, I'm become very skeptical of everything else, right? Yeah, uh, some people uh, in the yeah, go on, sorry. Sorry, I would just want to quickly add, um, you know, the times we kind of think that you know, um, these organizations are very clever and very, you know, folks, and that I don't deny that there's a lot of clever people. We also have to remember that you know, humans are fallible. And sometimes people, you know, they could not even, I'm, I'm just saying, if you will, I don't want to be apologist or anything like that. It may sound a bit like apologist over here. But I'm saying that, you know, sometimes people are incompetent. Sometimes people, they, they rely on sort of think tanks, if you will, for their understanding of that region over there, instead of going mm-hmm. to locals and sort of talking with them. Only the people on the ground, like, for example, US Special Forces, they have a type 
partnership with the Kurds, especially in the north of Syria. And that's understandable because they live and they talk to them every single day. But the commanders above them may not actually know the understanding of that. They may see things in a different way than, say, for instance, policymakers do. Which, sorry, you go. And I, and I think that's what Iran actually is, uh, why Iran is a little bit has the upper hand is because even their highest people know the ideology and the people on the ground and what groups are thinking what mm -hmm. and they know how to play that game they understand the people that they're dealing with and they understand the people that are, are against them i mean before the iran iraq war many people many u.s politicians didn't even know the difference between yeah. Shia and sunni right yeah. uh i mean that's that's pretty scary and these are the people that are making these decisions and that's a very important information to have if you want to uh w for people that are making decisions about the middle east but uh, so, so there are three questions that have been tagged uh since uh, si uh by moose for example is saying since a lot of the middle eastern countries are backwards why doesn't the global community leave them alone why does the western world have to worry about terrorists how would you respond to that Okay, I would respond to that first of all is that, you know, the United States never declared war on, you know, never, if you will, wanted ISIS to attack them or didn't want terrorists like Al Qaeda to attack them at 9 11. They attacked them. The thing is that just because you don't want to get involved in the war doesn't mean the war won't come to you. It did come to them for the United States, it did come to them with um, other countries around the world, especially with fighting ISIS and that. So when you say, okay, you know, why should we just, why not let's just leave these countries alone? Well, so, there are terrorists within these countries and they are, you know, big political, sorry, big ideological influences and extremists who attack the West and who provoke the West and who, you know, attack Western countries. So it's not just that the United States wants to be there for the sake of being there. It's because they're reacting to something that happened on their borders. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I would say there is not a single country that would not intervene in other countries if they, if they, could intervene intervene in other countries right like i mean it, it, i mean your na national interests don't stop uh you know at your borders yeah. uh, there are things that are happening outside of your borders that obviously have an impact on your country and if you have an opportunity to go change those things uh, for your own national interests uh, every any country that could would the reason why Can we talk just... about... yeah go ahead now, just quickly interject. Um, so, what you said there is actually um, something that um, the previous president George Bush actually George Bush George W. Bush said. Um, in a, I think he was in a, on M MSNBC or one of these interviews or something on Fox. I can't remember. He said essentially that it's you know in our national interest to make sure that these countries are stable, that these countries provide a civil society. If you will. you may not agree with George W. Bush on things most of the time, but you know if that those kind of words which you kind of echoed. So, if you will, so. It's just that there's you no. Know, it's in the national interest to make sure that those countries have, I guess, the state have stability. So those don't, those um, influences don't come onto your border. Right. So yeah. And again, when I when I when I'm being critical of the um, foreign intervention, I'm not arguing for no foreign intervention. What I'm arguing is that this was not the good, that was not the best way to intervene, right? Yeah. Not that he shouldn't intervene. I was like, yeah, this wasn't very well planned, was it? Um, but then sometimes, again, when you actually look at the interest groups that were involved in making those plans, sometimes you're like, well, maybe it was well planned because so this is why I'm saying that you can't assume that people are dumb, right? These are really, mm -hmm. these are people that have a making a career out of, these things and again it goes against what i just said uh because when people didn't know she has sony the thing is that given what they wanted to achieve the information that they had was not uh, was different because it, that information was not relative because sometimes if you actually this is what when it comes maybe it's conspiracy maybe or maybe it isn't but actually when you look at the people that are making the influences sometimes things that seem very irrational actually start making sense right um, but can I just yeah, um, yeah. say that, um, for example, if I take something like uh, the Iraq War, the Iraq War didn't come out of like a, a vacuum out of nowhere. It came because of the reaction of, uh, years prior to that of Saddam Hussein ignoring weapons expectors, hiding things for weapon expectors, violating UN resolutions, and came off the back of a Gulf War. And you know, it's, everything is in, if you will, in a, um, a web. It doesn't come on its own. So there's many different factors that go into it, and we can't ignore 
the fact also of ideological influence, like for that time, you know, the United States was intervening in places like Bosnia, Heterogonia, and it was Bill Clinton's intent that, you know, to stop the Saddam Hussein regime. So these kind of these foreign policy influences, I, I don't disagree that they do come like um, interest groups and in that, but it's not just interest groups. There's also people behind and there's also people who go for ideological reasons that have um, influence in the government as well. It's not just interest groups, I think. So. But but ideological interests also come in form of interest groups. Um, um, that, that is true, but I'm saying that it's not just solely, if you will, that these policy decisions are made just solely for uh, interest groups. Because then, you know, there's better ways, if you will, to make money than going to war necessarily. There's actually I'm, a lot of money to go to war. So. Yeah, but it's not, I mean, it's, it's not their money. It's, it's uh, taxpayers' money. And which is going, <laughs> which is going into buying something there, like they have, right? So it's a win-win. Um, uh, I, I just say I, I don't want to. I don't disagree entirely, but I do think that you know it's not. That's not just the sole of reason. Not. I don't know how to articulate it. <laughs> well, I mean, right here's what I tell people when I when I when I want to put a little bit more because it seems like I'm saying that United States is a force for evil only, uh, which is not the case. I'm just mentioning there are inf interest groups that keeping them in check is worth our while, right? But one thing I said, like human, for one thing, for example, United States ha has as an advantage is because the, because a lot of uh, people in United States are, have, are influenced by enlightenment um, era age values right um and because they came from that back that history that background their, their founding father of united states what came based on uh so a lot of principles that had to do with human rights uh being the major main focus of it right and this made a lot of uh, european and western countries have very powerful um, human rights groups, uh, human rights groups that have a lot of influence, and this is another interest group that ha is a positive for is is has a positive force on U.S. Um, foreign intervention. And what I remind people sometimes is that United States is when whenever there is a disaster, or there is an earthquake, or a typhoon, or a disease outbreak, United States is usually the first country to arrive there. Is the one that spend the mo most money there, and it's usually the last one to leave. Um, and uh, this uh, just in in Philippines when there was a typhoon, there was no other country uh, uh, like the United States that was there, and there was no, I don't know, I can't think of a much of a strategic benefit for the United States other than the fact that this is a the right the humanitarian thing to do. Uh, that the United States was very heavily involved in helping out people in Philippines. Uh, that were victims of the typhoon. Even when I remember when I was when I was in university in Iran, there was an earthquake, major earthquake in the city of Bam in Iran, and the main country that showed up in Iran to help the victims of the earthquake in Iran was the United States, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, so I know that there's a lot of areas within um, Iran, also like in areas like Rosh Helet and you know the northwest of um, Iran that have suffered tremendous earthquakes that the Iranian government does put enough money into the infrastructure to rebuild those areas that have suffered earthquakes. It comes for the PR and then sort of like leaves. Right. So, uh, so Beej is asking, Anthony mentioned that he also focuses on Kurds. Could he comment yeah. on their future? Um, and yes, I know they're not, they aren't a monolith. Okay. Yeah. So it depends where you want me to start on that because that's a big kettle of fish. So if you want to sort of ask maybe me specifics, maybe focus I could on Afrin and maybe a little bit focus on Afrin because I think I'm, I saw it somewhere above there. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, basically, if I was to focus on the Kurds um, recently, for example, sorry, let me sort of explain who the Kurds are first of all. Kurds are an ethnic group within um, the Middle East that have a rich history there from Indo-European descent come from Iran, that area, if you will. So they have a, um, a rich history. They have sort of like, if you will, a, a martyr culture and a war culture because they've always been oppressed by different regimes from uh, initially from the Persians, to the Ottomans, to the, you know, the Syrian Abathist um, entities, if you will. And we know oppressed by these various different groups over the centuries and over the decades. 
Uh, for example, in Halabja, the in the Al Anfal campaign, Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against them, which killed thousands of people in the north of Iraq, which actually led, if you will, to a humanitarian crisis, which the United States intervened to create a no-fly zone in the area, which now has turned into what is known today as the Kurdish regional government or the Kurdish regional area in Iraq, which is its, the Iraq's only federal region. And um, so the Kurds have um, suffered a lot throughout the years, but they're quite a tough group of people. Like most people know the Kurds through people like Christopher Hitchens and um, other advocates on that. Um, people like um, Jalal Talabani and um, Barzani, which are big heroes within um, Kurdish culture. Now, um, when it comes to fighting forces, the Kurds have a lot of different fighting forces because as the person mentioned in the comments is that the group is not a monolithic entity. The only thing that binds them is their ethnicity pretty much. Everything else, they can be have different ideologies. It's like, you know, you can't, it's for example, um, a Caucasian, you can't say that, you know, all Caucasians believe the same thing, they have different ideologies in that. Same with um, the Kurds. So Kurds in places like, um, Rosh Helet, which is actually eastern Kurdistan and it's northwest of Iran, Iran, they are more nationalistic. They have groups like the PDKI, you know, the Kurdish Democratic Party of Iran. Uh, they have um, Kamal, uh, Kamala and um, different entities like the PGA, PGAK, I think, who is a, a PKK group people in the area. They each have different ideologies and um, their main fighting forces, if you will, are on Perica or those who face death which is um, what it means in Kurdish. And these groups of individuals, they have been fighting in places like um, Iran, and most primarily people know the Kurds from Iraq, especially from the Iraq war, because the main group that helped the United States on the ground to oust, if you will, Saddam Hussein, places like, uh, and his forces in places like Kirkuk and that, were the Peshmerga, or were, you know, if you will, the Iraqi Kurds. And they're a fierce group that has helped the United States that has been a Western world quite some time. However, in regards to Afrin, there's another group of Kurds which have occupied the north of Syria for some time, and those are the Rojava Kurds, or Western Kurds there. Now, the Rojava Kurds, they're um, a group of Kurds, if you will, that have existed in um, Syria for centuries, if you will, ever since the Ottoman era and so on. In the 50s and 60s and even 70s, the Ba'athist regime, sorry, mostly in the 60s and 70s, the Ba'athist regime implemented Arabian policies. So that means they tried to Arabize the north of Syria for um, quite some time. So they tried to integrate the Kurds into the Arab identity. They forced many Kurds from their land and gave their land to Arabs, if you will, in order to demographically change the area. Now, the Kurds in the north of Syria, they mostly occupy from places like Kamishli, which is in the northeast of Syria, to Afrin, which is in the northwest of Syria, or were in the northwest of Syria until the Turkish invasion. Now, notoriously, the Kurds have a lot of enemies, as I mentioned before, but the biggest enemy of the Kurds, especially the Bakuri, which is the northern Kurds, which live in southeast of Turkey, and the Rojava Kurds, or the, you know, the Kurds that live in north of Syria, have been Turkey. And Turkey, yeah. this, this, is, this is the thing is when talking about the Kurds, it's a very big and complex issue. And it's, you can't really address one single thing without addressing other points around it. So I mentioned this purely as a contextual point so people can understand the history of why decisions against the Kurds happen. It's mostly due to um, not only national security interests, but also um, issues when it comes to anti-Kurdishness within Turkey, because Turkey for a long time has tried its best to Turkify its area, to try to assimilate all the ethnicities, including the Greeks and the Kurds, into a Turkish identity. Well, the, the Kurds are kind of like the Jews. Everybody hates them. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much. Because when they were drawing the borders, uh, they were like, everybody was getting their country like when the when the ottoman empire fell everybody like okay so this there's this new concept that we have is it's a european concept it's called a nation and you get a nation and you get a nation and you get a nation and the kurds were like hey can we get a nation and they're like no you're gonna get cut into four pieces <laughs> well, <laughs> i mean the in the 19 um sorry late 1910s early 1920s the 
bit of BBC War, they went to Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of the t at the time during the end of World War One, and said, "Okay, we want to try implement this concept of you know the Kurdish nation or Kurdistan, which is what a lot of Kurds want. They want their own home called Kurdistan, which is occupies, if you will, parts of no southeast Turkey, parts of northern Syria, parts of northwestern um, Iran, and parts of northern." Iraq, if you will, there's different parts, and I mentioned them like Rojava, Bashur, Bakur, and the Rosh Hedet, which is what the Kurds themselves and others denote each area, and each area has its own capital. But anyway, so this group tried to push it with Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson said, "Yeah, you'll get a state, you'll get a state," and then, then along comes the Turks who say, "Okay, you know, guys, you know, we've just created a republic now. You know, we want to draw our borders and shit. So can you know we do that?" And they they said, "Okay, fine, you do that." So for a long time, the Kurds were subsequently divided, not only by the Six Picot Agreement, which is, was an agreement between France and um, Britain to split, if you will, Iraq, the British mandate, and um, Syria into the French mandate, which created these really straight, strange little borders, if you will, which are actually, you know, it's quite funny. Like, I've got a, um, uh, a flag of, um, if you will, with Syria on it. And as you can notice, there's a big straight line, like a real yeah, yeah. straight line. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually quite funny because that's, you know, of course, that comes from imperialism back in those days. So mm -hmm. these groups have tried for, oh, sorry, you, you, inter you interject because I may be speaking too much. Yeah, the, the, in Iraq, there's, call, there's a line where they call it um, the hiccup line. Like, yeah, they were, I mean, when they were drawing these lines, they were thinking about the natural, the resources on the ground. They weren't really thinking about mm -hmm. When they were making Iraq, they just put the Shias and the Kurds and the Sunnis all together. Yeah, everyone together. <laughs> like, like you know, they were they 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 had a very 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 uh, small understand, a very you know, not a good understanding of what what was what's going to work and what's not going to work. They just drew them like they on a map, like a ruler, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but sorry, no, go ahead. I mean, yeah, you, there are straight lines is an indication of how little thought such long straight lines are indication of how much little thought went through drawing these borders exactly i mean um when it comes as i said they tried to create um kurdistan and of course that that failed the last time that i guess a kurdish republic sort of happened was in um, the republic of mahabad 946 and the iranian um <laughs> Iranian if you will, government at the time. It was supported, by the way, by the the, the Russians for quite. It only lasted for like a, a couple of months. Wait, just a big shout out to both Jeremy and Gene and the the live chat. I just got ten dollars from Gene and twenty dollars from Jeremy in super chat, which is which is big for a small channel like this, which is nice. Thank you guys. Um, okay. But you know, my, my uncle actually died in the war against the Kurds in Iraq. Yeah, he was a soldier on the Iranian army against the Kurds that were after the revolution the Kurds were like this is our chance for independence they are the, the like government is weak. and the, iran crushed them iran iranian government crushed them iraq saddam crushed the Kurds. turkey yeah. uh, so basically is uh, the, their country is divided between turkey iran iraq um and syria, and syria right and um, and that's why and this is why every every even in one of these countries, the Kurds want to want to get independence. The other three get nervous mm -hmm. because if it yeah. gets independence in any one of these four, it will become It'll a influence. base for the other three. Uh, for the three independent. Wow, Mike also gave me t ten pounds. Jesus Christ! Thank you guys. Um, <laughs> I've gained a lot of money today. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should, I'll invite you more often. <laughs> oh my gosh! No, no, I don't. Um, the thing is, is that um, when it comes to this um, region, it's just that the British and the French, they were sort of, they were in their own world. They were thinking, okay, we can use the Arabs to crush the Turks. I mean, that would be good. You know, the Arab rights and all that kind of good. We got rid of our big, the Ottoman Empire. We're the guys in power now. So they've divided France and Syria without regarding the Kurds. So when the Kurds tried to create a republic, like um, the Republic of Mahabad, which um, lasted for a couple of months, the Russians backed it because it was against, you know, of course, the West. And then the West sort of said, you know, guys, um, can you stop doing that? And the Russians like, okay, sorry, we won't do that. So instead of, um, I can't remember who was the leader of the Republic of Mahabad. Just hold on, I'm just going <laughs> to do something I don't usually do, which is Google. <laughs> you know, 
and, and when the when the when the Kurds were almost gaining in the, I, I mean, they were doing a referendum to mm-hmm. in the path towards becoming in the semi autonomous in uh, in Iraq. That was a major threat. Uh, this is this is another thing that pisses off the Kurds, right? Because the only the sec- the only other people other than Iran that invested so much uh, uh, ground forces against ISIS were the Kurds, right? Yeah. Uh, they're, they're the only like nobody was willing to make that sacrifice except Iran and the Kurds, and um, the thing is that the United they, K- Kurds were like. Look, we are we are the liberal, secular, democratic-minded, Western, yeah. uh, supporting group that you all wanted. Here we are. We're fighting ISIS. Help no, it us! This is me, off to be totally honest. What the West <laughs> doesn't acknowledge. And then, yeah. as soon as ISIS started falling, you know, ISIS were like, "Bye bye." <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. That, that's what's frustrating. Is because, you know, by the way, the person I wanted to mention was Kasi Mohammed. He was the guy who was hung by. Iranian officials after the Republic of Mahabad fall fell in northwest of um, Iran. But essentially, the Kurds, for a long time throughout their history, especially in the 20th century, they fought, if you will, uprisings against the dominant regimes. It's also mentioned in Iran with um, the uprisings against Iran because they initially they supported um, Khomeini's, um, up, Khomeini's revolution because they said, you know, Khomeini said, you know what, um, if you support our uprising, we'll give you, you know, autonomy and that. And the Kurds are like, yes, we're going to get that. And then when the revolution ended, Khomeini's like, <laughs> tough shit, <laughs> just uh, started attacking yeah. the Kurds. And then, and but but the, the thing is, this this kind of when when it, when the Kurds were waiting for the United States to back them, and they didn't, this after all the sacrifice they made, this is the message that people in Syria and other places will get from this. Mm-hmm. They're like United States and even Russia will be there when they need you and then they will leave you when they're done using you right yeah. but and th- and this will this long term um, message is going to hurt you and US's foreign policy in these areas and it, instead Iran Iran is like when when the when the Shia forces across the Middle East they Iran was there for them before they were even useful they spent Money on building schools, charity organizations, um, mosques, uh, this and that, and they were there. They were they were building. They were like, we were here for you forever, and we will be here. For, and people will know, like, if you're a Shia Vilayat Faqi supporter, you could bank on your own support. They know that it's going to be there, right? Um, and that level of reliance is makes Iran. Uh, for a lot of forces on the ground, a much more reliable ally than than uh, enemies of Iran is for their forces. This is why United States has ha- such a hard problem right now finding groups in Syria to be anti-Assad. It's hard. I mean, the the ones that they found are are small. They're not as powerful. They're not a big. You know, I mean, it's 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 a mess for United. Don't don't you? What do, what do you yeah. think? Well. Um... I just wanted to sort of like um, quickly touch upon, you mentioned uh, the referendum. So there was a referendum in um, Iraq, Kurdistan in October, which was sort of a vote on we want to have independence from Iraq. Because a lot of Kurds, they don't recognize themselves as Iraqi. They call themselves Kurd before they call themselves oh Iraqi. Oh my God, because... I, know, I, I know that. Here, here's the thing, an atheist republic, we get fan signs sent to us from different places around the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have the picture logo of Atheist Republic and where it's com- coming from. Mm-hmm. And we always have like a bit of a controversy when it comes from Kurdistan in Iraq. <laughs> because yeah. if we say, hey, find signs from Iraq, people are like, what? No, this is it's Kurdistan, not. right? Yeah. If we say find sign from Kurdistan, people are like, no, Fuck it's Iraq. You. This is Iraq. Why are you trying to divide our country? <laughs> you know, that, that's when you mentioned something very important. Because, um, a lot of Kurds for a long time, it goes back to the Saddam Hussein days. I mean, for a long time, Kurds did not recognize themselves as a part of Greater Iraq. I mean, they didn't really 
they, they were always oppressed by Saddam Hussein's regime. They were always oppressed by Arab rulers. They never really had a good relationship with the world with Arab rulers and that. And because of that, they wanted to have independence. I mean, Barzani, who was the at the time president of the Kurdish regional government, he wanted to push for a referendum. And the referendum had a 73%, I think, turnout. And most people voted for independence. But, you know, the Iraqi government, they simply said, no, we're not going to allow you that independence. And so on. So a lot of Kurds within Iraq, they're, they, they stay they long, if you will, for an independent Kurdistan because of the fact that it's better than Iraq and that. But at the same to at the same time, just going, I guess, back to your point on si sorry, your question on Syria. When it comes to Syria, the main groups that the United States are backing is um, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is behind me. You see the back of the Syrian Democratic Forces. Right. right. So. Um, the SDF, as it's known, acronym. Oh yeah, actually, Moose asked that about that. I missed that question. He was wondering what's the what's the flag behind you. Oh yeah, sorry. So basically, that's the flag of the Syrian Democratic Forces. Now, what are the Syrian Democratic Forces? You may ask. Okay, um, the Syrian Democratic Forces is the largest, if you will, um, multi-ethnic coalition that the United States and um, the Rojava government have put together to fight ISIS extremism. Now. The Syrian Democratic Forces consists of two large groups. The first being um, the YPG, which is many people have heard of the YPG. I mean, I've got a little, uh, do I show, oh, never mind. It's, I've got a YPG flag as well by the side, but my camera doesn't turn that way, so I can't show you. So um, the YPG, or the People's Protection Units, there were a militia that was formed after 2004 in the Kamishlu riots. Now, if you don't know what the Kamishlu riots is, you even know what even Kamishlu is, where Kamishlu is. <laughs> is a town in northeast of Syria. It's a Kurdish-dominated town primarily. In 2004, after a soccer match, there was a lot of riots by the Kurds. The Ba'ath security forces, they came in, they crushed those Kurdish units. However, the Kurdish groups that did form were called the People's Protection Units. They were a militia formed from the locals. In 2011, at the peak of, if you will, um, the uprisings in Syria, at the time of the Arab Spring, there was something called the Kurdish Spring that was going on in places like Iraq and primarily dealt with um, Kurds rising up also against the Ba'ath government. Now, at that time, the PYD or the Democratic Union Party, the biggest Kurdish party, if you will, in northern Syria, started to back, if you will, the YPG. And the YPG growed in numbers because a lot of Kurds were joining its ranks to oust the Ba'athist regime. And what happened is that the Kurds, they fought against the Ba'athist regime up until um, 2013, where they kind of made a truce, if you will, sorry, 2012, a bit of 2012, 2013, depends how you look on it. And they made a truce between um, the different, you know, between the Ba'ath regime and um, the, the Rojava government, because Rojava at that time created like a little de facto area from Afrin to Kobani, to Kamishlu, to Sezeri, to Hazaka, to every other area in north of Syria, just for the Kurds, and also for Arabs and all those who joined their revolution. They called it the Rojava Revolution, which was a revolution to create, if you will, a, a democratic and feministic, if you will, experiment in northern Syria for the Kurdish people. However, right up until 2013, there was also fights against the Islamists of the opposition. So that there was a lot of Islamists within the opposition because, of course, you know, in the north of Syria, northwest of Syria, places like Hama and um, Homs and Aleppo, they have a lot of conservative um, Islamists in that area. And a lot of these conservative Islamists, they join people like um, El Nusra and, you know, other groups like that, and Jaish al Islam, these other different groups with the opposition of the Free Syrian Army. And these groups started to. Um, to actually, they started to attack not only the Kurds but also the regime because they viewed, for example, a long term, a long term narrative that the Syrian National Coalition, which is the, the chief governing body, if you will, of the opposition in the northwest of Syria, has always made the narrative that um, the Kurds are an apparatus of the Ba'athist regime, even though it's not true, because they viewed the lack of attack by the YPG on the say or the the Syrian. Arab army, if you will, they view that lack of um, action against that aspect of um, the, the Syrian regime as being, if you are complicit with the Syrian regime's rule. What are you going to say? No, uh, yeah, um, 
There, okay, so this is for a lot of people. This is very um, the chords are very confusing, because, especially yeah. because the different the different groups among the chords are spread across different countries, four different countries, yes. and they all have three letter word uh, uh, acronyms for their groups. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. And then it gets very confusing yeah. of who's 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 a terrorist, who's on our side, uh, who's Turkey against, who who is Turkey is fighting, which oh one of them gosh. is on. So it becomes um, it's a little bit uh, complicated. But I, I do, but I, I I mean the curves are very different from each other, right? But I do think if the if they share one thing, which not all of them do, um, is a lot. A lot of them do want, some of them want outright independence. Some of them just want more autonomy. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of support among most courts. They want more independence, more autonomy. Maybe the disagreement is a lot better. It's full out independence or just more autonomy. Um, but yeah. this, the fact that they want more autonomy from the countries that they're in is something that is it safe to say that's among all of them uh, they share the yeah. most? Is that is that fair, to, well, fair thing to say? Yeah, it's a fair thing to say because I know a lot of actually um, Kurds on the ground. I speak with them via Facebook and Google Hangout and you know Skype or whenever I can, where they have good internet connection. Because you know in the Middle East, <laughs> the internet connection is not really that um, great right. in places. But um, I know a couple who live in Aleppo, for example, in places like Kobani, and they say you know prior to since they're treated as outsiders for being Kurds by Arabs and that. There was this general, if you will, hatred for the Kurds. Kurds, you know, kept to their own, if you will. They put their own little groups, you know, little own communities. And um, for the large part, um, prior to the uprisings, Bashar al-Assad actually made little reforms for the Kurds. They actually, he finally recognized the Kurds as citizens of Syria in places like Hazaka. Because, you know, of course, the uprising pressured him to say, oh, shit, I've got to, you know, do some liberal things and you know recognize autonomy there and that but there's enough and that's why they led to uprisings but yes a general um consensus if you will with kurds is that they long for a home a home like just like the jews long for israel they long for a home because there's a lot of diasporas within germany and other places full of kurds who you know they've had to escape their home countries because of the tyranny of the various regimes around them right and i and i think that if 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 one if U.S. was really serious about its uh, playing it strategically uh, and you know making sure that it's long term long term investing in the Middle East, the main ally that they could have banked on was the courts, right? Um, yeah. I mean that should have been something. I mean these are the most West uh, U.S. friendly group used to be the most West uh, U.S. friendly groups in the Middle East. And if you want to be a strategic player, they're um, helping uh, fully investing in them and their uh, and their interests would have been the strategic game to play. The one, I, he, let me know if this yeah. is fair, and then I'll go to Moose's question in the live chat. Okay, sure. One major reason why United States felt uncomfortable is because Turkey, even though they're having a lot of anti-U.S. stances, they're still a NATO country, yeah. right? And NATO take uh, raising, um, you know, attacking military, having a military attack in uh, Kurdish forces in, in Iraq and other strategic places. Um, United States had to be uh, like, felt like, okay, I'm moving slowly back. You know, yeah. I'm not going to touch I mean, it because it can be like, I'm not going to go in head to head with a fucking NATO member, right? Like, Right? Well, the thing is, is that Turkey is the least NATO member out of NATO, arguably so. It's the least <laughs> NATO yeah. member. And um, for a long time, Turkey has always boasted as the second largest army in NATO. And it's like NATO's southern border, if you will. But um, for example, the, the real focus point for when the United States was when it came to support of the Kurds was with um, the siege of Kobani. So, for those who don't know what the siege of Kobani was, in 2014, um, ISIS attacked a little city in north of Syria called Kobani. And um, a lot of Kurds were killed and a lot of forces fought there. And the United States intervened with um, airstrikes to fight against ISIS. And Turkey, especially Erdogan, was like, holy shit, guys, what are you doing? You're supporting terrorists over here. And that's where the things started to sort of like divide. The stronger the United States supported the YPG, 
education, in other words. The stronger they support the People's Protection Units and the Kurds on the ground in the Northeast, the stronger Turkey became very anti, you know, very hostile towards America's actions in Syria because it views the YPG as an extension right. of the outlawed group in Turkey called the People's, you know, Kurdistan Workers Party, which is viewed as a terrorist organization. And I and I think country, uh, countries like Turkey, Iran, and uh, Russia are easier. You know, they can play the game of chicken better with the United States because the United States is more has more standards. Maybe I think so. They were like, "I'm gonna attack these people." And the United States is not gonna attack me. They don't. You know, I know they're, they're not gonna attack me because they don't want to go on a full war with a, a Turkey member of uh, NATO. Or Russia is gonna be like, uh, "Oh, you're gonna bomb mm -hmm. Syria. Move everything." into m most of your stuff into places where russia has bases because the united states is not gonna not gonna bomb them because obviously they're gonna play they're not gonna go to war with fucking russia right um well, so basically yeah. i mean because they are so ballsy and they could just move their you know united states is just moving its soldiers in the chest and they're bringing on their queens i mean they're still much smaller militaries compared to the united states but the level of commitment and the level of, um, you know, because they're not, they're not, democ you know, real democracies and they feel like they can get away with shit, they have a lot more flexibility on what they can do. And I think United States can't. Is that, do you think that's the way of uh, uh, looking at it? Well, yeah, I have to say, when it came to, for example, to get this back to an older question, because I'm sorry to say I didn't answer this question properly. Um, in regards to Afrin, so Afrin was in the, Syria's northwest, it's um, by the Horn near the southern border of Turkey. Um, in Afrin, it had been long occupied, sorry, not long occupied, it had a long presence, if you will, of the YPG over there. So, in, so after years, Erdogan has repeatedly been threatening to invade um, Afrin because he views it as a terrorist are coming into the country in Turkey to attack them. Of course, this is not true, it's more just justification to try and invade the area. But in other words, um, in January, the area was invaded by Turkey, and Afrin was taken by March. And there are a lot of fighters who were fighting on the front lines against ISIS in the southeast of, um, sorry, north, southeast, I guess, of Syria against ISIS in places like El Omar and that, and Deir Zor. They immediately, they start to go back to help their family members in Afrin. The United States, they said, where is the United States to protect us? And the United States for a long time had said, you know, oh, uh, we're, you know, we, 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 we understand Turkey's national security interests. And then afterwards, after the invasion had finished, it said, no, we are deeply concerned about what's happening in Afrin. It's all, it, it angered me to see this because I was seeing this in real time. And I can understand right. why this anti-Americanism that's actually happening within northern Syria now, and even in Iraq and Kurdistan, where a long time a lot of Kurds have supported the United States, is because of... Do we really want to rely on the United States if it's not going to rely, help us out? You know what I mean? Right, right. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, this this time of short term uh, play has been the pro the the reason why I think United States has a less of an influence than countries like Iran. You know how th there's a meme where the guy is holding his girlfriend's uh, hand. Yeah. Like, you know, I think like it should be United States, and the girlfriend is the boy is United States, and the girlfriend is the occurs and he's like looking at turkey and that would be <laughs> <laughs> really like what the fuck i'm right here i'm your ally what are you doing but it, and again even among the kurds think about how the influence iran had on the kurds because when mm -hmm. when the referendum was happening and they went into all these other cities to take to take the kurds like okay this is ours now this is ours now and baghdad was like no fuck over our dead bodies and they started sending t tanks and soldiers mm -hmm. and we were like oh my god it's gonna be an all right war between Kurds and the uh, central government <laughs> and <laughs> but what ha what happened what you know how it stopped it was just mm -hmm. one flight from Sole Soleimani he took went mm -hmm. right it landed in the Turkish area one meeting the Kurdish the Kurds pulled back all their Army. I, I have no idea what the fuck he told them. Okay. Well, but but okay. think about, yeah, go on. So this is Iran's Iran sends their leader of the Quds uh, army, and he sends them there to the, just one man. What? Yeah, one person. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Can you hear me? Sorry, I just like my I hit my microphone and went off on the ground like shit. Okay, never mind. Sorry, you were saying. 
No, I'm just saying Iran sends one guy, one guy, to talk to the Kurds, and the Kurds were like, "Yeah, for, yeah, sorry, um, pull back the army." For you know, well, here's your here's this is like what happened? Yeah, I, like how did Iran? I, I, how did they do that? Uh, it's it's really now. This is where things get very, if you will, very very you know complicated now when it comes to um, <laughs> everything when it comes to the Kurds. Okay, so you have Iraqi Kurdistan. So we've established that. We know that there's a region called Iraqi Kurdistan. Right. Now, within Iraqi Kurdistan, you have two big parties, the Kurdish Democratic Party and the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. These are the two big blocks. Kurdish, sorry, the Kurdish Democratic Party, they are in the north of Iraqi Kurdistan, which is an herbal area. So like the herbal is the capital of Iraqi Kurdistan. In the south, you have in Sulmani, so no, Suleimani. Suleimani. I think that's it. So Suleimani. It's another city that is the capital, if you will, of the PUK. Now, when this was happening, when the Kurdish referendum was happening, a hero of um, the PUK, the founder of the PUK, Jalal Talabani or Mam Talabani, he died, if you will. He was a he was he became the first president of Iraq, for example, that the United States helped um, elect into power a Kurdish leader, which. He was a big figurehead, and after he died, his son and his wife, Hiro Talabani, and I can't remember, he's the bold guy, the bold brother of the Talabani family, essentially, because there's big families, the Talabani's and Marzani's. So um, these guys, they go to Baghdad. They say, okay, guys, um, we'll give over Kirkuk. You just don't invade us, okay? And we're good, our body's like, we're good with that. Everyone's good with that. And <laughs> this is how it happens. So this this big rhetoric that the big networks of the parties like um, k24 rudal all these big uh, networks they sort of they pumped up this whole thing that you know there's going to be a fight between the peshmerga and the iraqi army and even the the pkk came in because you know the pkk is in the northern mountains they're in the Kandal mountains so they came down the guerrillas came down the guerrilla fighters by the way they came down they said okay we're going to defend you however the night when the the hashd al-shabi Came in along with the Iraqi security. I should say, just to be clear, is a is a Shia uh, yeah. Iranian yeah. force. Yeah. yeah, popular mobilization units or something. I think that's what yeah. in English. But um, you see, Iran has so many, so many chess <laughs> players, so many, so many different groups. Iran has to play. Like, let's move this here. Let's move that over there. Okay. I mean, if you, if you just like Google, like say groups that Iran supporting in Iraq, it's like a whole board of groups with different names. <laughs> right. So, so they all, they all, you know, they all support but, you. Well, they all... And how many US has? Like, you know, it's that flag uh, behind you, I guess. Um, and um, you have the creators, but yeah. Okay, so I don't want to explain these groups just yet because I want to quickly answer the point that you. Okay, okay. 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 <laughs> so essentially, the Hash al Shabi, they were coming with their vehicles and the ISF with their vehicles, and you know, people were wondering, okay, so there's going to be a big fight and everything. Then all of a sudden, the PUK Peshmerga, because each of them have their but the e family has their own, you know, military, if you will, because it's like tribalism a bit. So the PM, PUK Peshmerga, they withdraw. They get the order to withdraw. Then the KDP Peshmerga get the order to withdraw. The PKK are just like, they start fighting these units, and then they get the order to withdraw as well. Right. And it's just like, what? And so many Kurds, I mean, a lot of Bakuri Kurds, these are Kurds from Turkey, they were so pissed. It was yeah. so pissed. Yeah. I, I actually was watching this live. People are like, we've been betrayed. We've been betrayed. Like, yeah. so many uh, kinds of betrayal. Yeah, it's like the fat people, like, you know, obviously the, the KDP and PUK supporters, they said, you know, this betrayal came from America because they didn't intervene. And America said, they said, you know, guys, you know, let's not do this referendum now. Even though I supported the referendum, that, that you know, they, they the reason why they aren't in support of the Kurdish referendum is it jeopardizes the Iraqi federal project that they're still trying to build. That's why they're against the referendum. But anyway, so the real betrayal actually came from the families, the ruling families, the Talibanis, and you know, the, the Barzanis. They betrayed the people of Iraqi Kurdistan because they've been in power ever since 2003, and they've not really – they've done things to help the country. It's made the country – sorry, the autonomous region better than, you know, the rest of Baghdad and that. But ultimately, those Talibanis, they betrayed the people of Iraqi Kurdistan. It, it devastated so many, like 
so many Kurds were so pissed off. <laughs> right, and and this is right after have every all the many Kurds being so happy. There were parties in the streets everywhere because of the referendum. Like there was such a sense of joy because of that referendum among the Kurdish community. And then right after this happened, and it was such a big disappointment to everybody. Right. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that Kirkuk, a big center, a big city that Jalal Talabani had said that, you know, he would defend to the death for. Yeah. His son, his son gives the fucking town away. He gives it away to Baghdad. But but yeah. do, do you think Iran had something to do with that? Because it was oh, right of after. Course. I mean, yeah. PUK has always had a on and off relationship with Iran. It's, there's no doubt about that. But do you think the Soleimani sort of, coming and landing among them and talking to them, that's because they did the 180 on everything? Do you think it was because of that? I think that's probably part of it, but not a big part. I definitely know it's because of the deal that was made between, uh, you know, Baghdad and, you know, Soleimani, you know, the, 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 the city, Soleimani. I can't remember how pronounce it. Oh. <laughs> oh, you're talking about the city? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about Sorry, just let me uh, get the proper thing uh, done. I'm not talking about the person, uh, so right, right. There's two big, um, there's two, if you will, um, cities, if you will, in, oh, if you will, why am I saying if you will all the time? Sorry, there's um, Suleimani. There we go, Suleimani. Oh, which is another big city. Because, not, because I'm talking about the person with the same name. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like. It's pronounced a different way, like Suleimani, I think. Yeah. Suleimani, it's a female and version. Suleimani. You're, you're putting it. You're putting an A and the end of it, which is, I think makes it the female version of what I'm saying. I, I'm, I'm not Iranian, but I know that the. Oh, that's here, Arabic. That's the, not Iranian. Yeah, but go on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, whatever th that sort of, city, um, if you will, it's always had a positive, um, a sort of like on and off relationship, if you will, with Iran. I mean, for example. Many people don't know that the Kurds had a civil war in the 90s where the KDP or the Kurdish Democratic Party, they allied with um, Saddam Hussein's regime to take the PUK out of um, Erbil. And the PUK allied with Iran to kick, you know, to try to fight um, the freaking um, the, the, the Kurds on the other side. It was a sort of a civil war that the Americans weren't really too happy about. But um, yeah, that's, that's what happened. So. What was the other question you had for me? I have a new question, actually. Uh, Moose is saying, I feel guilty as an American for my country causing terrorist groups after 9-11. If the U.S. transitions to clean energy, we wouldn't need to fight in the Middle East over oil. How would you respond to that? That's, uh... um, it's a bit simplistic because, you know, not everything is necessarily fought over oil. I know there's a large part of it has to do with that, but not everything is fought over oil. There's ideological implications and so on. But I do agree that you know, if we had to change our means of energy, like if we had to go to renewable energy, for example, then it would save us a lot of things. But the problem is, is that there's not been yet a way for renewable energy to be utilized, if you will, for military purposes, as the military would like it. So oil is always a big uh, thing. Oil and those kind of resources always benefit um, the United States military. Right. So go let's go back to um, Iran mm -hmm. and and. Um, so, do you have any predictions regarding the nuclear deal? Like, is, uh, is, is um, Trump gonna pull out, or I, I think that um, don't make predictions. Actually, do, don't make predictions. I never make predictions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's not a good idea to make predictions <laughs> like that. Uh, so sorry for putting you in that position. But 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 I um, mm -hmm. but he, so. A lot of people think that the United States and Saudi Arabia and you um, and Israel, this is one block, right? Together, and the other block is Turkey, Russia, and Iran, right? Is that a fair? Uh, yeah, it's it sort of um, what Dalton wants to try to prevent is Turkey drifting to Iran. Right. So Turkey is sort of like now it's in that kind of it's drifting more and more to Iran. It's sort of like I would say it's sort of like allied with Iran essentially now. So it is essentially a part of that block, but it's not officially yeah. yet. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, they, I mean, it's kind of people are pushing allies to you know, to Iran. I think they're like mm -hmm. Iran was like, oh, you're you're giving us new friends every every time you do something. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but the um, a lot of people think that a lot of Iranians think that Iran's government should be toppled and just removed. Mm -hmm. 
and some it was like somebody like Nightmare Fuel over suggested that you, you know they're not just for intervention they're just in their support full on guns blazing moving in just outright military intervention remove the government um what do you th uh of iran iran is the main threat in the middle east and just should just just fucking go in there and remove the government what do you what are your thoughts on that i think ultimately we have to support the people because if we just go in there guns blazing remove the dictator that you know re remove the regime there's got a huge lot of plethora of problems that will occur there will be um if your groups that will be in support of course of um, the united states intervention but there will also be groups who will you know they'll view the intervention as an occupation and i think that we must make the sort of the same mistake with um, iraq if we're going to go in you've got to go in you know fully long-term strategy style and that has to fundamentally do with some people not but how are, you gonna, how are you going to find allies if the people in Iran don't want, they're like, they think that United States intervention might hurt, hurt um, I mean, again, this is not speaking for all uh, Iranians. There are some Iranians that would not want to kill me for even suggesting that there are some other Iranians that think like this. But, <laughs> but there are a lot of Iranians uh, that think like, don't intervene. This is our revolution. If you intervene, they're gonna just gonna use that narrative to show that this is like another internal uprising. Mm -hmm. This is like a foreign intervention kind of uprising. Um, so if you want to support from the if you want to support the people, what if the people are saying no thanks, we don't want your support? Again, I understand. I'm gonna get that ang some Iranian getting angry with me saying no, we need help. Why are you saying this, Armin? Uh, but there are also a lot of people who are saying like, no, please stay, stay the fuck out. Uh, this is our revolution. And also, a lot, here's the thing: both of these people would also get upset if I point my, if I point out there are a lot of people in Iran that are sympathetic to the regime, right? Because one thing that the protest showed is the level of dissent that does exist in Iran, right? Mm -hmm. Any any kind of suggestion that people in Iran there is not there is not a huge popular anti-government um, uh, group of people, their protests showed that uh, that's false. But I think what some Iranians are trying to portray it as is that the government has next to no support, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, I think, very extreme way of looking at it. I know there are millions of people in Iran that will give their lives for Khamenei, okay? And... The thing is that if you remove this government, those people are not just going to sit and be like, oh, okay, I guess we have a new government now, <laughs> right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? They're not, you can't, you're not going to get those people to just shut up and take it, right? Um, so what are your thoughts on this? That is a tough one. I mean, when it comes to these things, there's no one simple way of doing it. I mean, I'd go for the multi-prong approach of... Um, supporting if you will no why do i keep saying if you will sorry it's a habit force of habit <laughs> um it's okay. so supporting um those groups on the ground you know who you, you saw on the white wednesday i don't know what the woman's name is who leads the white wednesday or, you know stealthy freedom or something like that i can't remember the name but um, oh, you see what they yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. See. like when you see those uh, people there's there's a lot of um, middle class people who support um the revolution sorry who support um, the protests and that but there's also a lot of um, poor people that need to also be addressed. They can't just be just the middle class rising up, if you will. There needs to be, of course, the support from those pop in, more in poverty. Because there's a lot of Kurds, for example, who still have their homes destroyed from the earthquake that happened a couple of months. And some of them um, fixed in mm -hmm. that. They're still living on the streets. There's a lot of Kurds who have already been like, you know, they have got had to become cobblers, if you will, trying to um pass um resources and stuff to different areas and that there's a lot of suicide some yeah. people can't just think, yeah it, it's a lot of things that need to be addressed and i don't think that necessarily military intervention straight up is going to solve all these problems we, there has to be a better way and the problem is is that it's it has to be multi-pronged there has to be different approaches like change the internal ideology trying to export different ideologies but the problem is, is that some um, the united states is not good when it comes to its rhetoric on intervention it you look at the bush administration it was very poor with articulating how it would want to be and that and what it would do and so forth 
as opposed to sort of Tony Blair's, who was much more articulate when he came to his um, support for intervention into Iraq, you need to be, have a proper, P I know that sounds very cynical, but you need to have a proper PR firm. You need to have a proper way of right. exporting your, you know, ideology. And I think this is something that Unisys is not going to be able to fix for many, many years. I think mm -hmm. Unisys has a huge image problem um, in the Middle East. And the thing, and, and and a lot of people think a lot of people that only care about U.S. interests and um, are not uh, don't care about human rights. They, I mean, they do care about human rights, but their main, their top priority is U.S. United States in, um, interest. There, yeah. they were like, we don't really give a shit what these people think. We just want to make sure that it's stable and it's not a threat to the United States, right? And. Yeah. And I think that they are miss uh, these kind of people. The, the, that kind of argument is really heavily discounting the amount of the importance of uh, um, support on the ground matters. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, democracies are always more stable. I'm not always. Well, more, more often more stable than than um, the, uh, theocracies or uh, any other form of authoritarian regime, right? And the United States spends a lot of resources and time in uh, a dictator that a U.S. ally, and then all of a sudden it falls. There's an Arab Spring. There's a revolution. The Shah falls. Something changes, and all of their investment just goes down the drain. And now I have to deal with these new people, right? But if it was a the problem with democracy is that if if it's democracy, you would get the Muslim Brotherhood sometimes, right? Yeah. So it's, you're not going to get the U.S. allies. Um, and this is why this takes a lot more. Uh, and but democracies are more stable, and the democracies are much better allies too, because they grow with you, they trade with you, and them becoming more powerful is within your interests. Then because of democracy, it's harder. They, uh, because it's freedom, the borders become open to trade. I mean, look at uh, the United States, people that are always against U.S. intervention. I mean, look at you look at after after World War II. Not I know not during. Okay, after uh, United States interventions in in Japan, all right, and in Germany, right? They are these are countries that are now uh, they they were you know they were in a very bad situation at that time. But they but they were U.S. allies. and United States invested a lot of uh, resources trying to make help them recover. And it, the return on investment on these countries are huge. They are now powerful, strong economies that the more powerful they are, it's, it's good for the United States. And the more richer they are, they, they become more better allies and they become richer allies, which you're trading with and you're having mutual benefits with them, right? Um, I mean, look at the what, what happened with Germany, right? When it comes, uh, they were almost bankrupt and they went from being the enemy to the whole, every country, uh, around the area to now becoming the best, the uh, powerful uh, ally, um, and you know, an ally that is use you know, is is very helpful to both Germany itself and to. I think, but I think the problem that a lot of um, U.S. leaders have is public support, and public exactly. support is the, the the cripple, if you will. Exactly. So, but but this is the thing that the when when it came to fighting communism. Um, United States didn't just fight a military battle. It also ideological battle. It, it was also an ideological battle. And it was also selling its ideology. That uh, And it, the reason why it was so successful and the reason why the intervention of the United States was so welcome, because the American brand, the American culture was welcomed, right? Uh, people in 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 East Berlin wanted some of that, you know, some of that life, some of that culture. We're like we want, you know, America, you know, even in many uh, communist countries that were going the way communism in uh, uh, um, in Europe, it was it wasn't just U.S. intervening; it was the people wanting that kind of uh, that ideology and that that those values in their countries, right? But now I think when it comes to the Middle East, United States is not, is only fighting. A military battle, and it's not mixed with a good ideological battle. It's and I think the PC culture in the United States is partly responsible for that, right? And I think mm -hmm. this is why I think uh, this whole social justice warriors have actually taken a powerful weapon away 
from their own government. Because the way that the United States came out and called communism as evil, it wouldn't even dare today come out and call Islam as evil, right? That would be like, no, no, like, you know, that would never happen. Um, but, but the thing is that I think if I, if I was planning against Iran, uh, again, this, is a, this would have been a long-term plan. It, I, oh, actually, this, this was worded very badly. I, and this is something that I think that the U.S. government needs to understand as well is because they shouldn't say against Iran. Iran did this. Iran did that. Because they're helping you know, Iranian, get, Iranian government get support from its people. That, it helps that. It helps get that narrative, right? They always should refer to it as the Islamic Republic. And there's two. You have to say Iranian people and the Islamic Republic. And if you say, if you refer to it like this, instead of saying Iran does this, Iran does that, if you say like we have to do, we have to defeat the Islamic Republic, instead of saying we have to defeat Iran, then that language really goes a long way uh, to people thinking like, okay, they are against these motherfuckers, not against us. But if you're saying we have to defeat Iran, then you get you're gonna get a lot of the, well, fuck you. To back uh, among from even from a lot of people that are not pro regime, right? Yeah. Um, and and these things these things really matter. But I think this is a this is a huge long term investment that that's uh, that United States has to make before thinking about uh, opening this Pandora box, because if yeah. it opens this Pandora box before making that investment, I think you're going to get something way worse than ISIS coming out of Iran. Like I think if you open that Pandora's box. I think you're going to get a Shia version of ISIS that is way more, way better funded, way more organized, way more spread across the Middle East, way more influential, and way more strategic than ISIS ever was, way more pragmatic, way less self destructive than ISIS ever was, right? And uh, you're going to get. You, that, yeah. I'll give you, um, just to interject again. I'll give you a sort of a, um, a good example of um, where the United States so far is getting things sort of slowly right. It's support for the Syrian democratic forces behind him. Now, with the whole Russia revolution, a lot of the fighters, they are Kurdish, they are Syrian, they are Syriac, they are Arab. They are fighting an ideological war, not just a militaristic one, an ideological war, which they support ideologies like democratic and federalism, feminism, pluralism, and democracy. And those things are good values. And if you look at the areas controlled, if you will, by uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces, they're starting to rebuild areas for schools. They're allowing to teach different languages that have been priorly banned under the Ba'ath regime. They're getting a lot of local support from that. And that's the kind of ally that the United States need. If the, uh, if the United States could you know, export that, place like Iran or something like that where they have local support they build local support over time within Iran where you know they don't push militarily yet, but they support internal if you will um, revolution you know support the groups that want uh, civil society they will get a huge benefit for that because if they if the Iranian people can see that okay look there's the United States it's helping you know support the values of this revolution and if they can just do that which is at the moment not going to happen anytime soon no, given that, of course their support, for, their support for Saudi Arabia makes it very hard for people to to see United yeah. States as an ally, right? But yeah, it's not. Yeah, but go on. Sorry. You know the thing is that I know why the United States is you know trying to keep the Saudi bloc because of course about the power balance things, but also try forcefully reform uh, Saudi Arabia internally, which is it's a bit hit and miss at the moment because you know. The Saudi reformers are more tokenistic, you know, they're only they are little trinkets to pose to the West and that. But there yeah. has to be a gen genuine commitment, a genuine commitment to the locals, a genuine, you know, intolerance, if you will, of um, despotism and tyranny. Like, you know, you generally mean what you say when you say that you're for human rights. You should be for human rights. If you're not, then just stop pretending. Exactly. You know I mean? Exactly. If you have to do that across the board or else when you pay, when you come and say like, hey, we're going to come here and help, uh, advocate human rights, people are like, yeah, get the fuck out, <laughs> right? So yeah, I'm not going to believe you. Then not, this is not what about is We're not saying that you shouldn't support uh, – sh people say like, oh, why can't you see that 
even though they're doing something bad there, we should support them for uh, we should support them here because there are human rights violations happening here. So don't do what about them. Support them here, even if they're if they're not being consistent. No, I, what we're saying is that that consistent consistency influences their success here. Because yeah. if you're not consistent across the board, if you're just only saying like, "Hey, human rights, human rights," only where it happens to serve your interests to go against the government that is your enemy, then people are. People are not idiots, right? They're gonna be like bull fucking shit. Like, no, right? No, you're not. You're not a human rights activist. You're 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 funding the greatest humanitarian crisis of all time in our, in our history, and you're telling us that you care about women uh, being forced to wear hijab in Iran, or like, really? You know? Um, I mean, it yeah, doesn't I, it doesn't help their PR. Yeah, it, it doesn't help at all. I mean, honestly. This is, I understand why there's this power balance thing going on, but that, that's what gets me. As an internationalist, I support you know, international humanitarian law. And, you know, if countries, you know, countries shouldn't just exist for the sake of existing, just to get resources and states, just to balance power. No, if you have an ideology, an ideology like, you know, pluralism, democracy, you should spread that globally and you should be invested in that spread. Yeah, and and they, and you shouldn't have double standards when it comes to Iran versus Saudi Arabia because that double standard will be called out, right? And that double standard will make people think that you are not their ally. And once you get there, once you use them for your um, regional interests, you're not gonna be there to back them up, right? You're not gonna be there to support them. And you, once you make the, the government that you want to make a uh, weak weak, and then you left away, you left, you're gonna leave the, you're gonna leave the masses to be slaughtered uh, by this government because you already made this government weak enough. You know what I mean? You're not gonna that, be yeah. And that is the biggest issue that I have sort of with the United States presently, is that with the Syrian Democratic Forces, a group that I strongly support. This is one of the few groups in the decades of American policymaking and decades of American friends of yours that is actually has the values, has the force and power to make a change in Syria for the positive, for the positive if you will. But the thing is, is that if the United States abandons the Kurds, if you will, uh, not if you will, but no, bans them to Turkey and other regimes, the Kurds will... Because, you know, a lot of Iraqi Kurds, they've already stopped believing in American support. They've given up with, some of them have given up with, you know, even considering America a friend anymore. They're looking towards Iran now. They're looking towards the nearby countries for support because they don't feel that, you know, these groups, these, you know, these You're foreign looking at Iran right now? There's a Kurd that are looking towards Iran. Even though oh Iran has been persecuted, there's a lot of Kurds that are looking towards. It's not all Kurds, by the way, but it's just because of the reaction to the United States action. You know, a lot, I bet you a lot of Iranian, a lot of people in the Iranian government is like, are like, we don't even have to plan anything. They're just having like, to, sit back and like, oh, just oh have to be like, you know, sit back and watch. Like everything is just happening for them. It's so ridiculous. This is, no, it's but, a struggle. But but he, he when it comes to Iran, I I really think here's the here's the problem with Iran right now. Okay. Every single force for or against the government in Iran tries to um, tries to make it seem like what they believe in, what they want, represents the vast majority of Iranians, right? Uh, and it's really hard to get good numbers. I saw some statistics that came out of Iran, and then it was proved it was shown that these are, you know, these were made up, um, but. The people that want the government in Iran to fall, um, if you listen to them, it, you will come up with this understanding that almost everybody in Iran, Iran wants this government to fall. There are, and then they have these people in Iran that hate the Iranian government, but they think if this government falls, they're the next Syria, right? Yeah. Or the next Libya. Um, and there are, and then, then there's a group of people in Iran that um, they're like, no, we love, we, we everything's fine, right? They like this government, right? And this third group, a lot of people think that they are very small, and they're not. Um, they're actually now, uh, and they, I think they have learned recently that their lack of presence on social media has given that impression that they're small. 
and they are sh they are showing up on Twitter. They, you know, they are like the Iranian hashtags used to be all anti-government, but they are they they have learned their their lesson. They are even though Twitter is banned in Iran, I don't know. They are on Twitter, like even though they're pro-government and the government is like no Twitter, there are a lot of pro-government forces on Twitter in Iran now. And they just recently also, uh, just yesterday, uh, they banned Telegram. Do you know about Telegram? Yeah, I know about Telegram. Telegram, it's a social media app that is very popular in Iran. And just like WhatsApp is double and um, uh, what is it called? Encrypted. So that's why a lot of people in Iran trusted it as a way to spread their activism. Uh, and they, 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 it just got filtered, and I, there's still no word whether it's possible to use filters, um, to breaking filters. Like uh, the 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 ruling that came out is so you know Iran recognizes the fact that the so social media has a huge influence uh, uh, on any threats to uh, from within to his to his government. And I don't think I don't think it's feasible for you to create something. I mean, Russia tried to do that with Telegram, and they were unsuccessful. So I think it, it, it's going to be very difficult for them to make Telegram inaccessible. I think there's going to be a lot more push to make it easier for people that are not tech savvy on how to get around the filters. And I think getting more people learn how to get around the filters is going to make their presence on other social media platform even more prominent like because telegram was so convenient because you didn't need to get around the filter but now because you need to get around the filter i think it might cause more people to more iranians to also show up on twitter uh which has a more global audience than telegram but but the thing is that this this uh social media activity from within iran is i think what we need to capitalize on, and by we, I mean yeah. you and me, because I don't think, uh, the, or other, and many other activists, like thousands of other activists, because I do think the government of the United States is is uh, it doesn't um, doesn't have the same level of um, resources when it comes to fighting the ideological battle. They doesn't they don't have the credibility, all the or the understanding, or the resources to do this ideological battle, right? So. And I think the ideological battle where I'm, I'm actually writing about this right now is uh, what uh, what is the main concept that could be attacked when it comes to Iran's government that could unite um, atheists, uh, liberal, non-practicing Muslims, and devout Muslims that are maybe devout Shia, but are not maybe are questioning the government. Um, what what is it that we could target that could unite all these three groups together, right? Um, and and I think it's the concept of velayat faqi, okay? Sir. Because this is a new invention uh, when it comes to Shia Islam. Okay, it's very new. And it's very popular now, as if that's the only branch of Shiism that exists. Uh, uh, that's what I thought when I was growing up in Iran. I didn't know this is. I didn't know how new this thing is. Uh, but I think a lot of people don't know the history between behind the concept of Velayat Faqi in Shia Islam. It was just Khomeini's Shia Islam. And if they knew how wishy-washy this was and how out of nowhere it just came. I think a lot of Shias also would find, would think like, what the hell? This is the history behind this thing, right? Like this is this is why Khomeini and Khomeini are our religious leader. But I think if that belief in Velayat al falls, even amongst Shias, the whole foundation where the whole excuse for why Khomeini and the Velayat al are the main ruling powers in Iran would just collapse on its head, right? Collapse on its on, on, on its own very, on its foundations. I mean, and I think that's that is something that atheists can get behind because they're like, yeah, Vilayat Faqi is bullshit, and atheist activism is growing in Iran. A lot of this, um, uh, a lot of these people that think that yeah, I'm a Muslim, but these uh, I hate religious people which is a common thing people say in Iran, uh, but uh, they could get behind that. And a lot of Shia Muslims could actually, there's a lot of Shias outside of Iran 
that hates the concept of Vilayat Fari. And they think that, what the fuck just happened? We were supposed to wait for Imam Mahdi to come back before we are in government, right? That's the whole point of Shia Islam. Sunnis think we should be in power. Shias were supposed to wait for Imam Mahdi to reappear for them to be in power. But when, when Khomeini came into power, he just was like, yeah, I'm going to change Shia Islam. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, the, the, the new understanding is that the Vilayat of uh, is supposed to hold government for Imam Mahdi until he comes back, right? And we're going to hold the government for him. And, and if people, if more Shias in Iran, especially the new generation of Shia Muslims in Iran, understood how just how new that is and how out of nowhere that came, a lot of them might actually theologically um, be against it. And the thing is that I don't want to make theological arguments for what, something because I'm an atheist. I don't want to argue religiously for people for why something is right. I could just be like call something out as bullshit, right? So I'm not saying that. I don't want to make the argument for why religiously uh, you should be against your government, but I could, I could make the case for why at least this concept in your ideology is so obviously and historically, you know, we have documents and records within your parents' lifetime, if not your own, your lifetime, your parents' lifetime, we have documents that show how out of nowhere this came from, right? So at least this religious concept, we could all get behind. That is bullshit. But it, didn't, yeah. didn't, I, I, I've never seen any uh -huh. major push against this concept. And I think it would be um, a huge... Yeah. Sorry. Um, I have never heard of the concept before. Like, I've never heard of that concept before. So I think that's pretty much a lot of Westerners, I think. Maybe I'll speak for the Westerners who don't know what that concept is. At least in that kind of, you know, that, that way you've said it and like that. They've, they've touched it. They've heard of it before, just not in that, like, way before. You know what I mean? With What, what was it called again? Velayat um, Fari. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so he, he, here's the 180 that Sunni Islam and Shia Islam did um, from World War One till now. Okay. Um, what happened? Um, so, for for 1400 years, um, Sunnis were like, you know how you know you're on God's side if you are. If you're conquering and winning wars and dominating country people, that means God is on your side. That's how you know your God is on your side, right? And conveniently, that's because they were they were ex conquering and expanding and winning wars, right? And when you ask Shias, do you know how you know God is on your side? Is when you're the victim, is when people are oppressing you. And when you're oh, being uh, wronged, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's how you know God is on your side, right? Um, and that because historically Sunnis were in power and Shias were always being attacked and abused and they were the victims, right? And Shias were like, you know what? This is we shouldn't even be in power, right? Because we have to we have to wait for God's represent, you know. You should, uh, uh, you know, our imams should should be the leaders. No, nobody other than the imams could be the leaders of an Islamic government, right? And the the last imam, which was the twelfth imam, when he quote unquote went to hiding, they're like, okay, he's gonna come back, Imam Mahdi, and when he comes back and he's alive and he's just among us, sometimes we see him, sometimes we don't. When he comes back, all all country every country is going to become Islamic and Islam is going to dominate. But before then, we can't be in power. We shouldn't be in power because we don't have a religious uh, authority or a religious uh, God's chosen religious authority to lead us. Right. And then but but what happened, even when the Safavid Empire came, the 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 person that started the Safavid Empire he was trying. He was trying to sell the argument that he is the twelve Imam, right? Uh -huh. And um, even when Khome when Khome when they asked Khomeini after the revolution if he's the twelve Imam, he didn't say no. He didn't say yes, but he also didn't say no, right? Um, but then with the when he introduced the concept of Velayat Fari, which was completely out of nowhere for 1400 years. So, so after, here's the thing, when, when, when it comes to Sunnis, when the, when the, when the last caliphate was defeated and when Ataturk 
dismantled this whole idea of uh, a khalifa. Uh, that was the people, Muslims. Are, this was such an ideological shock to all Muslims. This was the first time after Muhammad for 1400 years that there was no Islamic leader for all for the um, for the uh, entire Ummah, right? And Sunnis were like, "Where did we go wrong? We we had an empire. Like, what the fuck happened? We don't even have a caliphate anymore, right? Like, what are we doing?" And and the Sunnis had were this was such a moment of humility and you know self reflection in the Sunni world, and the answer that. A lot of the answers to this humility was the rise of, uh, you know, the new jah the new jihadi movement, right? Yeah. Um, Side and all that kind of thing. Exactly. So, uh, there was two types of. There was a pragmatic reaction to it, where it's like, well, look, who's powerful right now? The West is powerful. So what are, what are they doing? We need to learn from them. They're they're doing science. They are doing this. They're doing that. Let's copy them. Okay. And there was another, but the exact polar opposite reaction to that was like, no, we are, the reason why we're so weak now is because we moved away from Islam. We moved away from God. We have to go back to our roots. And that was the uh, Sayyid Qatabs and the uh, yeah. um, uh, jihadis and all Mujahideen of that time, right? Um, so there was two different, it's always whenever you have an ideology being defeated, you get the you get the pragmatic reaction to it, and you get like a radical <laughs> reaction to it, right? Yeah. Um, it, there's two forms of reform in that ideology, but so th when 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 the Sunnis were completely ch changing up the way they look at Islam and what they're doing because of them being weaker, she has had to rethink they, how they look at themselves because now they were in power after the 1979 revolution, right? They're like. Okay, we hold the government now, but we weren't supposed to. <laughs> so they, <laughs> so they invented the Ayat al-Fari, very convenient. Um, and, and you know, and I, this is why um, the, uh, the Khamenei is sees Shias in some Shia competing powers, uh, inf influencers in Iraq, uh, like Sisani and his camp and all that people uh, as as a major. More of a th the more the people get closer to your ideology, the more of a threat they are. That's why you, uh, Shias hate the Sunnis more than they hate the Jews and Americans, and that why Sunnis hate the Shias more than they hate the Jews and Americans, right? Because it's getting too close to your own ideology, right? Uh, is uh, and and this is why Shias that are for Velayat Fari are see Shias that think Velayat Fari is just made up fucking bullshit, not not that. Everything they fit, all the religions are made up of, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but they they think like, yeah, this is just Khomeini's excuse for being in power. We shouldn't be in power. Um, they see that as a threat. Even recently, there were some um, Shia clerics in Iran that are being arrested because they still secretly think that Khomeini shouldn't be in power because this goes against the main doctrine of Shia Islam, right? So. Um, these they see this as an internal threat, which are they are way, they are afraid of this more than Amer United States, okay? More than Saudi Arabia, more than Israel. This is what keeps them up at night, right? This is why any any form of group that of people that get together and become a, ba a big group, they have to go in and they have to break out the group, even if it's even if it's not a challenge to share. This is why the the Sufis in Iran, in Iran, as soon as they grow a little bit, they're like, nope, 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 you can't be this big. They go in and they just try to break everything down and like spread them and <laughs> arrest their leaders. Um, oh, somebody is asking a question. Jindi is asking a question. Muhammad bin uh, Abdul Wahab is one of the reasons that we have the ugliest version of Islam. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, the, when people say Islamic reform, I always think of Wahhabism. <laughs> that's a yeah. that's a form of Islamic reform. Because you know, it's actually quite interesting. It's that people think that reform is always positive. That's always like in the Western thing. We always think that reform is positive. It's actually not positive. It's a neutral term. It can be positive or negative. And technically, you know, the Islamist, you know, um, reforms, if you will. Sorry, the Islamist. Um, uh, movements and that not only in the late 18th century but also the mid 20th century, they are technically reforms of the religion. No, just a more radical sense. 
Yeah, I mean, they, they are basically, um, they, they, these Wahhabis, um, they are, I mean, if you believe the Islam, they're rightfully pointing out that the Shias are the, should be the greatest enemies of Sunnis because the greatest sin in Islam is shirk, which is having partner, which is having partners for God, right? Oh. And what Shias do is they pray to their imams, they kiss the shrines of their imams, they pray on little, you know, more when they pray, which is uh, Sunnis are like, well, fuck, that's idol worship, right? Um, when we, even when pe they even pray to imams like this, which is childrens of imams, um, you know, you know, many times my aunts, my family, when in Iran, when I was in Iran, when they pray, many times it's not like God, please do this for me. They're always like, Ya Hussein, please do this for me, or Ya Ali, <laughs> please do that for me. Like I, God's a little guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just like just like the problem Protestants have with Catholics when they pray to saints, because Protestants yeah. are like, what the fuck, Jesus is God, not these. How how could you pray to saints, yeah. right? Um, so Sunni is pointing to Shias are like, why are you praying to Imams? Imam, these are dead people. We, uh, we uh, Sunni is like, we don't even pray to Muhammad, right? Um, God is the only one that you can pray to. So they see these as Mushrikun, which is the worst of all people. So they think like the Shias should be their number one enemies. Um, um, and actually, Gene points that out that uh, th his main focus was monotheism, which actually. Uh, the Islamic term for it is Tawheed. Tawheed is the most fundamental, you know, the one thing that uh, if, if Islam is about is Tawheed, uh, which is the oneness of God and the oneness yeah, of the divinity of God. And certainly Wahhabis point that Shias are basically are going in the most, the most fundamental part of Islam. Uh, Shias are challenging that, right? And Shias were like, no, we're not just, we're not worshipping them. We're just revering them. But certainly they're like, no, fuck you. You're worshipping them. Right, so and so, but 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 Wahab went around and you know, um, you started killing a whole bunch of people, so he wasn't very popular in Saudi Arabia until this the house, then you got the, the house, Saud, of, Saud. The house yeah. of Saud discovering the house of Wahab, and this is like Game of Thrones kind of shit, right? <laughs> like, hey, we uh, we could do something, you you give me your ideology, I give you my. Um, you know, money and financial backing, and together, we'll be. Well, they gave birth to this pure evil, <laughs> Saudi yeah. Arabia, right? It was always the and and actually this marriage. So, the they they got married. One daughter from Wahhabi family got married to the boy uh, to the boy in the South family. If I'm correct, Gene, do correct me if I'm. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, actually, she mentioned Tawheed here as well. So this marriage is such a perfect example of how religion is used in the Middle East because Saudis didn't give a shit about the, 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 the theological arguments of the Wahhabis. They just are like, this is useful to us, right? And the Wahhabis, they're like, yeah, we're not very popular, aren't we? We need the financial uh, support. So they, so this... Yeah. What, what, what's interesting, Paul, is that um, especially in the 70s, um, was sort of reforms going around to the Middle East, like in places like Afghanistan, in less extent in Iran, with the Shah, and all these kind of areas. Um, you had um, King Faisal, who was the reformer king, if you will, of the um, House of Saud, who took over and sort of made radical education reforms within the country. And this sort of, like, this stoked, if you will, the radical elements. And, you know, this led to the seizure of the mosque, which was of inspired, if you will, by uh, what was happening in Iran. Iran, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this led to the fact, the reason why, um, for example, uh, the religious authorities got more power in Saudi Arabia was because of the fact that um, the intelligence forces needed to be able to go into Mecca, if you will. They need the blessings of um, the religious sect, if you will. And the religious yes. sect said that, you know, in exchange for this, w we want more power, if you will. And that's what happened. So these, you know, these special operation forces from France and Pakistan, they went in, got rid of these extremists that had Mecca um, seized. But, but let's, let's give a background to people what you're talking about. So after the yeah. 19th sign of a revolution in Iran, uh, yeah. the people, uh, the, uh, a whole bunch of other Muslims around the world were like, hey, they overthrow their secular government yeah. for a Muslim one. We want to do the same thing. And this is where this is was the perfect 
opportunity for uh, the Wahhabi forces in Saudi Arabia because then mm -hmm. a whole bunch of religious people are like, no, our government is too secular. We want it to be more religious. And yeah. then the Saudi, the House of Saud was panicking because they saw what happened in Iran, and they're like, went to the Wahhabis and like, you know, you know, we were always friends. You know, we, <laughs> you, you guys should have more. Sorry for making everything too secular. Tell us what to do, whatever you want. Um, no, <laughs> we will cover every fucking woman. No, no woman will be able to yeah. even fucking drive a car. Will uh, yeah. no position, no work. Just tell us what you want. Just please save us from your fund for from your crazy people that you're sending out. Like whatever. That, it, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, and they gave a blessing to the Pakistan intelligence and the French intelligence, and they went in. They got rid of these guys. And what happened is, was that you know the House of Saud, which actually prior to that was like you know it, it, there was the religious body over there, then there was the secular body over there. There's like you know we'll we'll keep you guys in check because you know we have friends in the Western like that we want to Westernize. When that when that seizure of the mosque happened. It panicked, as you mentioned, it panicked the whole house of Saul. And they said, okay, you know, guys, religious body, we need, we need them. We need them. So we're going to come closer. We'll allow them to, you know, they control the domestic policies and all this. Yeah. But uh, one, one reason, okay, he's what he's what's dangerous about what Ben Salman is doing to himself. First of all, I don't, I didn't buy any of this fucking reform. It's all bullshit, I think. I know people disagree with me, Dana. But I think the reason why he's not getting a little bit of a, tell me if you think I'm wrong. Um, but the reason why the Wahhab, because this is what Reza Shah tried to do, he tried to completely destroy the religious influence. Uh, and, uh, uh, but then it went and came um, Biden by the Iran back in the ass in the form of an Islamic regime. This is what Ataturk tried to do, and now Turkey is more Islamic than ever. I mean, not ever, <laughs> right? But ever yeah. since after the fall of their uh, Khalifa, which well, there was no Turkey before. There. So yeah, more Islamic than ever. Um, and um, Saddam was seen as a secular force. He was he was seen as a reformist yeah. moderate as well as before as well. And very interestingly, uh, uh, he got very obsessed with Iran, which was his yeah. eventual uh, the result of the, the economy completely being destroyed and eventual downfall. So yeah. this Ben Salman seems to following the same pattern, right? I mean, if you go too much against your religious establishment. Um, Especially, this is so much like Saddam because he's also now focusing on reform, but he's overly obsessed with Iran as well and spending so much money on Iran as well. Um, and people are like, hey, we've seen what happens to these people. I mean, we saw what happened to the Shah in Iran. We saw what happened to Gaddafi. Uh, we saw what happened to uh, Saddam. And Bin Salman is going to go the same way. There's going to be a coup very soon. These religious uh, authorities in Iran are not going to let him do what, all these things, and it's going to there's going to be a major reaction. The only but but I don't know if this is correct, but maybe the reason why Wahhabis are a little bit silent on all these reforms right now is because they're afraid of both Iran and also of Islamic Brotherhood uh, influence from within Saudi Arabia. Is that is that something you see? Well. Um how I see things, if you will, is I, I, I have a bad habit of saying if you will, just in the way I said it. But um, um, when it comes to Ben Salman, he's doing these reforms more for uh, economic interests and that they're more tokenistic. So they're just like tokens thrown to the West and saying like, look, we're reforming. Look, come investors, come invest in Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, Ben Salman is keeping religious um, constraints, if you will, uh, constraints. But, you know, he's got to deal with the fact that, you know, there is a very conservative religious element within the country. And trying to balance that with, you know, Western support, it's it's not an easy task. And I think ultimately, Ben Solomon, but, you know, he, sorry, you know? No, but he, he's not, I mean, he's he's throwing out little shiny objects in front of the media while it's actually, his human rights record is getting worse. Yeah, of course. Definitely. So it's like, hey, let's arrest a whole bunch of people and ramp up the executions uh, but hey women can drive now <laughs> right so <laughs> like hey look at this women can drive or like oh let's also now do a power grab in the military and you know do that and like hey women can join the military now wow and and they can go to the stadium <laughs> like yay clap and then like I'm, I'm also don't look at the fact that i'm bombing hospitals in fucking yemen 
because mm -hmm. you're killing little girls there and you're like oh i'm so pro woman and ask all the yemeni girls that are being you know starved to death so very pro woman women can get to go to stadiums now in saudi Arabia. and people are like oh it's what about is why can't you uh, attack condemn that and also see this as progress in saudi arabia and like it's not this again this is not what about is because we're talking about the same guy okay it's what yeah. about them if I point to someone else's action as an excuse for um, uh, for something else? It's not what about them if you're talking about the same guy, and it's not what about them if these reforms are a dis are meant to be a distraction from those atrocities. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, we mustn't forget that Ben Salman was head of the foreign ministry at the time when the Yemen war started. He was the one who called intervention into Yemen. He right. was the one you know, who went off on holiday and went into Yemen and started this whole Yemen war. And the thing is, bin Salman's a classic dictator. He wants to, after you know, the older guy, bin Salman, the, the, it's dead in that, you know, when he eventually dies, bin Salman will become king of Saudi Arabia and he will maintain his luxurious life as he will. So this, these, his reforms are really just shallow. They're bits yeah. more to keep his power in. And, and yeah, I, I mean, honestly, the best way to best way to to uh, violate human rights is to take away all of the rights, right? And mm -hmm. then every time you want to do more violations, just give very cheap, you know, cheap, um, you know, rewards to people. As just we take them, take it away from them, and give it back to them whenever you need to make something else happen, right? Yeah. Uh, and the thing, the problem is because the source of these reforms, so uh, are not democratic, you could just ta as easily be taken away by the next guy as they were being given, right? You know, it's it's they're not. You know, if he wants to do something serious, something really a serious reform would be to abolish male guardianship, which he will not do because that will anger the whole religious establishment. Because you no. Know, Things, allowing women to drive, allowing people to go to the cinema, and that you know, it's always under it's undermined by the fact that you know, male guardians can tell their woman, you know, not to go out to get a driver's license or you know, not out to go do this or that because the male guardianship system is still in place, and that needs to be abolished for any true reform to take place. I mean, honestly, this this guy has committed so many war crimes. He needs to cure cancer to even closely come close to <laughs> come close to. Uh, you know, okay. Seriously, like, um, and it's so it's so ironic where, she, where he where he came out and called uh, Khamenei uh, Hitler, uh, even though he's yeah. drop he himself is dropping bomb on uh, people. GND mm -hmm. is saying Saudi's intervention in Yemen was inevitable. Houthis are launching ballistic missiles to Saudi, and they are serious. Uh, uh, they are serious threat to Saudi. I mean, it says a lot about Saudi Arabia, where a bunch of um, people, poor people that don't, can't even don't have shoes, are are a major threat to uh, one of the governments that spends what I think is one of the highest amount of military spendings in the world, one of the top ones, right? shows how incapable Saudi Arabia is when it comes to, uh, you know, and, and this, here's the thing that Iran uses as an, another way to sell anti-Saudi um, propaganda. It's anti-Saudi propaganda. When, when Nikki, uh, or anti-US, when Nikki Haley came and showed the missile that uh, came from Houthi areas to, uh, to Saudi Arabia, and they're like, hey, look, it has Iran parts in it, right? Um, but Iran, Iran came like, okay, if that's your argument, there's a whole bunch of U.S. parts in there as well, right? So uh, that, that is, that's, a, I guess, a good um, counter argument. Because, yeah. But still, it has the point that you know the Houthi rebels they are getting backed by Iran, and I and they are firing missiles at Riyadh. So yeah, but then they're like, crazy. they're like, okay, again, this is devil's advocate. Okay, okay? they're saying, look. Saudi Arabia is raining down missiles on Houthi areas mm -hmm. and they get two missiles back at them and they're crying out <laughs> like, oh, oh my god, yeah. Iran is violent. like, no, like, oh, they're defending themselves. What the, what, what the, like, yeah. you, you're like, that's what I know. This is, but the thing is, it's such a powerful sell. 
They're like, really? So you want the Houthis to just take it up their ass and just say nothing, right? You want to throw, oh, you're, yeah. you're shattering them in missiles and you you're, 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 you want, like the, 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 you had a UN meeting over Iran saying whether Iran did help Houthis or uh, make these missiles or not, but mm -hmm. nobody argued, nobody said anything. I mean, they said something, but they didn't do much over all the missiles that Saudi is sending to uh, to Houthi area, um, mm -hmm. and and another thing is that people, you know, Saudi said like, hey, we're gonna have a nuclear weapon too recently, right? And mm -hmm. Iran, here's this is how powerful Iran's propaganda is because they they have the, they use the best arguments. They're like, hey guys, where why is nobody calling out Saudi Arabia for actually saying? They want a nuclear weapon. We're saying we don't want a nuclear weapon. You're saying yes, you do, and you shouldn't. And you have all this whole the whole world is coming down on us for not having it for not making a nuclear weapon that we don't even want. But when Saudi Arabia says, Okay, we're gonna make a nuclear weapon, you guys don't even blink. Right? So Yeah. I mean those are actually they were, those are quite um good arguments. Quite personally, I would don't want Saudi Arabia or Iran getting hold of any nuclear device, in my opinion. I know, but yeah. I'm not saying they sh Of course, of course. But I'm just saying that every time there's this double standard, the, re the thing is that people in the West haven't heard these kind of propaganda, okay, from Iran, coming from Iran. But the, yeah. but the Muslims on the ground in the Middle East, they have. And they think Iran has a point, and they think Saudi Arabia and United States is being hypocrite. And they do. And when when Ben Salman comes and says, "Hey, Palestinians should take the Israeli deal, and Israel should have its own country and stuff like that," Iran is like, Iran is thinking, "Is this guy just writing our lines for us? <laughs> right? Like we want to. We were we were trying to desperately come up with the conspiracy that Saudi Arabia is." like a you know dirty jew lover but that in their eyes and they're like to tell me to tell muslim like oh, hey uh, look this is what saudi arabia is like we don't even have to try right uh, yeah. and i don't think if ben salman knows the level of ground support and legitimacy he's gonna lose for you know for even considering for so openly yeah. because they used they always had this hush hush talk behind the scene talks with Israel, right? But Ben Salman is not even shy about it anymore, right? And Arabs are like, all the Arabs and other Muslims in the re region are looking at it and they're like, their jaws are hitting the floor for how, how openly this guy is talking about Israel, right? And I don't know if Ben Salman understands the consequences of such support for Israel when it comes to, yeah. I'm not by the way, a lot of people might think yeah. I'm justifying these things, right? I'm not justifying, I'm not pro-Iran, I'm not pro-Israel or anti-Israel or pro there's you can't you can't talk mm -hmm. I think like being um Israel obviously obviously is, is a democratic, more democratic country than any. I just think it's not as simple as being pro or anti a country. There's so many different forces in Iran. There's so many different forces in Israel. And there are so many different interest groups. And you, you can't just make blanket statements about it. Even within Iran, there are forces that you have to recognize which forces you want to support, which forces you don't want to support, right? Definitely. I mean, it's, it's a lot of... Um, Sorry, I talked too much. No, 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 no. You're fine. Fine. I thought. I think I talked too much. No, no. <laughs> so, a lot of these, a lot of people in the West, they simply aren't getting this information because of things like the media, or just because of the nature of how media has become, essentially with um, sound bites and you know, a quick things, you know, entertainment reliance on what's trending, and that, and that sort of that also creates a big problem because a lot of Westerners, like for example. Me, me, I didn't even know about that concept that you mentioned when it comes to Shia Islam and that until you just told me about it. I may have heard of it in a different form, but never in the way you... Uh, let me see the English it. version of it. I think it's called yeah. The Guardian of the Jurists. Um, is that what it's called in English? Yeah, The Guardianship of the Islamic Jurists. Oh, okay. 
Um, I, but still, I haven't sort of heard, heard about that uh, before. But I'll look, look into that because I think look into that because I think that's that's the, when it comes to ideological battle against Iran. That's it. That's I think what people should recognize as the yeah. the target of your arrow. But go on. Yeah, I was going to say that in terms of um, that ideological struggle. Another thing I've heard is um, Persian nationalism, and I don't know how legit that would be. Sort of like a form of nationalism for Iran that is before the you know the Islamic um, regime and that. I don't know how legitimate that would be. Because I know that, in, for example, in Iraq, um, there's a lot of um, Iraqis who have who are actually becoming a little bit against Islamism. Now they may there are a lot of Shia version of jihadism and that, but um, there's a lot of um, Iraqis that I sort of I know that are more supportive of the secular elements or secular movements who have become, as a result of the extremism that they face, they become, if you will, in the uh, I say post-Islamism stage where they they don't want that extremism, but they don't want to abandon it entirely. So I don't know how you would put that into the context of Iran, but um, the Persian nationalism sort of like it's I don't know how legitimate it would be, but it's essentially the idea that okay, let's go towards like a, a Persian kind of a before have, the Iran regime. I have so much to say to that. Okay, <laughs> I don't go for it, go for it. <laughs> But before I go to it, I want to read Jean Z's comment because I actually disagree with you, Jean. Uh, she, she, uh, he or she is saying, the way I look at it, Saudi is keeping the war going in Yemen because they they think that they can drain Iran's economy and they think they can last longer. Uh, I am against the way that they intervened in Yemen, but you can't deny that the intervention was inevitable. Actually, I think it's the exact... Jean, you might disagree with me, but I think it's the exact opposite. I think Iran is trying to keep Saudi Arabia and Yemen as long as possible. The amount of investment Iran has had in Yemen is so small. Like, honestly, it's been pocket change. And they managed to get Saudi Arabia to waste billions of dollars in Yemen while they spend like a, a fraction of their own budget on, on, uh, on Yemen. They just have to... I, I, I do think that Saudi Arabia, um, th there was an initial uprising, which um, maybe Iran wasn't at first. It, if Even if Iran wasn't at first involved in that, uh, when Saudi blamed it on Iran, Iran was like, okay. <laughs> because <they're> like, <laughs> if, if us being involved is going to make you come um, waste your resources here, then sure, we are involved. Um, like here, some here, maybe here, have this missile. I mean, they could. Here's the thing: they can't send a missile to the Houthi. These things have to come apart into many different pieces and reassembled in Yemen if it's coming from Iran, because the security between uh, is you know. I mean, they bombed all the ports. They have so much eyes on there. They're getting a missile from Iran to Yemen, it's if Iran has managed to pull that off. Um, they ha must have the best under underground network. I'm, I think the way you do it, you sell, you don't sell it directly. You just give it, you know, flood the black market somehow, and you make it the you make those things cheaper. Um, I don't know. It's it's complicated, and I think you just you can't just give them a missile. That's that's really hard to uh, miss for the people that are. I think it just you gets assembled in Yemen and maybe they get maybe they, maybe they just show them how to assemble can, can I don't I know how to, yeah go can on. I just quickly interrupt and then you can continue um for example a lot of um non-state actors such as militia groups and that they sometimes get their weapons from old products from the cold war right. and that black market those old cold war weapons so you may get some stuff that are from Iran from the you know the Iran Iraq war for example like right, right. So maybe that's the sort of argument, or, but I, I don't know. Just continue. Yeah. The, the the influence might be as as high as them sending the parts, mm -hmm. or maybe as low as a secure line them uh, from Tehran telling them how to get the parts <laughs> and how to assemble the parts. I don't know, but I think that, I think <laughs> so, some level of influence at, at least after this war has mm -hmm. been proven. I don't. There are some 
contradictory reports of how much influence was there before. I know there was, when the Houthis were doing their uprising, there was a communication with Tehran happening, which, which was shows that at least there was some moral support, at least. Uh, but the thing is that whatever the support was... Um, uh, I know, I know, Gene, that you're not saying they're right. I agree. I know, I know that you're not agreeing with them, but I do think it's been. I do think that strategically, it's Iran that is um, that is investing very little, and it's Saudi Arabia that needs the money right now, uh, and is and is desperately running out. Like is, 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 Saudi Arabia is stressing out over losing um, oil revenues. And they're wasting it on this war, and and it's in it's in Iran's best interest for this war to continue, and it's against Saudi Arabia's interest for this war to continue. But Saudi Arabia will never leave this place um, if, if while it's on the losing side, because they 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 did the mistake at at, at the very beginning defining what a win means, right? Because if you keep it vague. <laughs> You know, this is what this is what Russia does, right? Like they're like, we're coming in. What's the goal? We're not going to tell you once because we, because if we tell you, then when we pull out, then we're going to have to admit defeat if we didn't achieve those goals, right? But Saudi yeah. Arabia uh, very clearly defined <laughs> what their goals are, so they can't leave and because that would be a defeat. Um, but going back to your what you brought it up, the the national, yeah, yeah. The, this is the problem in Iran is is that the greatest force against the uh, religious establishment is uh, the nationalist uh, but the thing is the nationalists are not very organized um, so he, he, here's the thing um, and this is why Saudi Arabia is such a powerful enemy for Iran because it unites the anti-Islam um, nationalists with the Anti, uh, because they because the anti-Islam the, the the hatred for Arabs um, is what unites the the nationalists because they hate the Arabs, right? They see Islam as this foreign, barbaric ideology that came in and took down this glorious Persian Empire that apparently <laughs> was heaven on earth before these. They call them they call the Arabs alligator eaters. These are these oh. these. Okay uncultured uh, uncultured barbaric uh, desert dwelling people came and took out they took away our superior aryan aryan empire oh. um and and you know iran means the land of aryans right oh, um my that. name my name armin means the protector of the aryan land oh good <laughs> <laughs> so these people think that uh, that um uh, Islam and Arab for them, Islam is an Arab invasion, okay, of their uh, of their culture and uh, of their identity, and they hate the Arabs for it. Um, and the Shia establishment, the Shia um, uh, clerics, they see the Saudi Arabia as Sunnis, and they have uh, they hate the Sunnis, right? So they're like, hey, we hate Saudi, uh, we hate the Arabs, you hate the Arabs, let's get together and hate the Arabs together. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 okay, then that, then that will be a problem, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but, but the thing is that these, uh, um, I do, I do see as, um, I don't, if you remove this, the government, the government in Iran, I still think that even though the greatest anti-Islamic force in Iran are these ethno-nationalist Zoroastrian loving people that don't even know what Zoroastrianism stands for but they just know it was the religion in Iran before Islam so I so it must be great um, um, so they uh, they think that and and a lot of the, some so many of them argue that uh, Iran has to go back to Zoroastrianism uh, Islam is the Arabs' religion. The Aryans' religion uh, is <laughs> Zoroastrianism, and and you know in, this is why uh, there was some. Arguably, I know a lot of people would debate this and like, oh, army, you don't know your history, but a lot of people argue that the reason why uh, you know in World War One uh, maybe Reza Shah was playing footsies with the German uh, and named Iran's uh, official name back to Iran from Persia because it was going back to its Aryan roots. 
uh, and also because the, some people claim, and again, this is people saying that I don't know how true this is, is that the understanding they what they wanted to have is that Germany is going to be the Western Aryan power and Iran will be the Eastern Aryan power, oh, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, th this is this is. It, it, it does get a little bit scary. I mean, I, I know I will I'm lose a lot of Iranian fans when I mention about these things because these are people that will see me as um, they think that I, I'm not a nationalist. I'm a, I'm a human rights activist, right? Um, so, I mean, I, um, so a lot of people in Iran will hate me for this because they think I'm, um, I, when I point out that there's a lot of racism from these nationalist types, right? I, I way too often I've heard that yeah, once we once the Iran's government's gonna fall down, we're gonna gather all these imams and we're gonna burn them and hang them. Oh, uh, and you're like, yeah, all all the imams, yeah, and some of them are like, yeah, their moms and their wives and their children. Um, oh. Yeah, and like yeah. the thing is that the 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 imams and the Shia religious people. They are there's a whole bunch of them there. This is not gonna end well if these people want to <laughs> do a power grab if the revolution if if there is an outright removal of the government. So I, I still do think that these people these nationalist types, even though they have very very passionate against Islam and they're very very passionate, there are also liberal forces in our okay. So this is not this is a, this is not the entire opposition. We have a lot of people that are not like this. We have so these people, some of, many of these people don't even argue for democracy, right? They want to bring back the monarchy, right? But they are, yeah, they want to back, go back to um, the Pahlavi times, right? So, so, so a lot of the chants during the protest was like Reza Shah, Shuh Ruhat Shah, which was basically um, praising the previous um, oh, yeah, monarchy, right? So, but the thing is, there are, lot of, there are a lot of people that are also part of the opposition that are not like this. There's a lot of atheist, mm -hmm. secular, democratic uh, forces there too. But the problem is that neither these nationalist types um, or these democratic atheists or secular types and or secular types, they're not very, they're not very organized. They're not very united. They don't really have a plan. And I, I think if you remove the top from this government, I do kind of think that the most organized people will do the power grab. And I think it's going to, the Shias are still the most organized ones, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I know people are going to hate me from Iran because they, the main, the, the thing is that the, po the most popular hashtag consistently on Twitter from Iran is Barandozam, which is an, which is a call for removing this government. Mm -hmm. And anything short of that, the opposition will see that, a lot of the people from the opposition will see that as people that are on the side of the government and not the side of the people. So I might be seen as like that from by some people from Iran. Um, that, but, but what I would suggest is this Barandozam actually supports that hashtag and that movement because the reform movement has failed the Iranian people. But a, a threat of an uprising, a toppling of the government. If, if even if it doesn't topple of a government, the threat of a, a top, a, a credible threat of the gov government falling from within, is the most powerful way of getting this government to change. Do you know what I mean? So but even I though, agree. yeah, go ahead. So uh, I was going to say that um, I also get like um, when you when you speak about um, different. Uh, sex and different um, groups within Iran and sort of critiques to those different groups. I also get the same kind of um, hate, if you will, for my critique of um, Iraqi Kurdistan and um, Kurdish nationalism because um, contrary to popular belief, not everyone who supports the Kurds is a, you know, a Kurdish national supporter. For example, I just support the Kurds' right to autonomy. I support get a homeland necessarily, but not that's not completely like you know, ethno-nationalist. Where it's only Kurds and that, because there's a lot of Kurdish conservatives, especially in Iraq and Kurdistan, who want a Kurdistan that is just for Kurds, that is right. you know, their homeland and that. I'm more supportive, if you will, of the more um, quote unquote left wing, if we're going to have to use this you know, left and right wing dichotomy thing. I'm more supportive of um, the 
democratic confederalist movements like with the Rojavi codes behind me and that when it comes to democratic confederalism, just basically self-defense, autonomy, the right for Kurds to practice their language, their right to integrate with one another. They don't, they don't necessarily have to have a state, just let them have their rights and so on. So I, I understand that I get hate as well from um, Kurdish nationalists who call me a, a traitor, a Western traitor, which is actually, I feel, at times I'm like, you know, fuck you, you don't, you don't know me kind of thing, because I'm not, I'm not here to uh, please you and sort of please you. I'm, I support the Kurds. I've supported the Kurds for, since, a lot, since I was like 16, so I can much of my, my life in sort of politics, if you will, political thought. Now, I've supported their rights. That doesn't mean I'm going to be blind to them and not critique them when they go stuff up or when they do wrong, because then that won't help me, it won't help them either. It's right. best to be cr critical as well as supportive. Well, I, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, a lot, one, one thing I noticed when it comes to the ethno-nationalist Zoroastrian-loving mm -hmm. people in Iran is that they they came out and did a full they went full circle and some of them are now supporting IRGC even though they hate <laughs> Islam I like at first when I discovered this I was like what the hell's going on here how is that possible and I and what I what I noticed is that they are loving how the Quds army is being very, I mean, they, they want the Iran's borders to expand, right? They think that uh, Iraq is part of Iran historically. A lot of these Arab countries are not shouldn't even, are not even Arab. They think they're Persian. They're just Arab speakers, but they should their 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 DNA is Iran, uh, Persian, and they should go come back to Iran. And they think that the Aryan the the IRGC unknowingly is fighting on the side of the Aryan race. Uh, <laughs> so, so they're like, it, it's, it, we can support. And, and, and what they are also afraid of is, and this is not all of them, okay? There's a lot of these people that, um, you know, um, nationalist types that are, can, are uh, waiting for the day that, for this government to fall. They're, you know, but, they're, but some of them that I notice is that they also think that if this government is removed, if, the, if anything democratic comes, or anything humanistic, uh, or yeah. anything that listens to people, then we're gonna lose more of Iran because a, a lot of uh, groups there's a, the Kurds now want to uh, yeah. be sep be separate. So what is it? What is a democratically humanistic? They want an authoritarian regime because they're like these people should not leave Iran, and we're pretty sure a wishy washy <laughs> soft democratic government is not gonna attack the Kurds if they want independence. And they're not. If they just ask them to please don't leave us, they're not. That's not going to stop them, <laughs> <laughs> right? And the uh, Azerbaijanis are going to want their independence, mm -hmm. and the Arabs in Khuzestan are going to want their independence. And they're like, what are we going to be left with? And <laughs> right? Yeah. And they're like, uh, th these nationalists type are like, they're very. Um, yeah, this have this idea, the idea that the bigger is better. So they, it's kind of like you know. They don't want even if, if one inch of their borders to get lost anymore. In fact, they want to expand that. Um, but the ones that are arguing against them keep on trying to highlight the Kurds and the Azerbaijanis and the Arabs that say, no, I am Iranian first, Kurds second. You know, I will mm -hmm. always be Iranian. That's my identity. Mm -hmm. But the ones that are threatening Iranian, Iranians that are threatening other Iranians of what happens if the government falls, they highlight the Kurds and the Azerbaijanis and the Arabs that want independence. They're like, look what happens. These people are going to leave us, and we're going to be left with nothing. Iran is going to be smaller. We're going to have you know what, I, yeah. I, what I find um, ironic about a lot of these regimes in the Middle East is that they 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 claim to be anti-imperialistic. They claim to be anti-Western. They claim to be fighting against quote unquote Western imperialism. But at the same token, they're trying to defend borders that were created by imperial empires, such as Britain and France. So I'm talking more in the case of the Syrian regime and um, the Iraqi government, the central government. They want to maintain the borders that were created by imperial powers because it's they don't they don't want their lands to be broken apart and separate. For example, from that's why Abadi and um, that's why you know a lot of the, the 
regime of Iran and Syria, they're all united against the Kurds. They may hate each other individually, but they're all united against Kurdish independence because they know if one state, as you mentioned before, if one state gets um, Kurdish independence, then all of other states will look at that state and say, you know, we can do it as well. Right, and, and this is why um, Iran's being against the Kurds um, wants to get the Western powers to recognize Iran as a major influence. They're like, listen, you have to deal with us for what the things you want. Like without, they're basically saying, without us, ISIS will still be here. You needed us for ISIS, and you you're now going to need us for the Kurds, right? And that was a power play that they had when they when they went to uh, Iraq and basically they made the uh, Kurds uh, step mm -hmm. back. Like, look, this is everything in the Middle East um, happens because through us we are the gatekeep we are the new gatekeepers we are the new we are the you might be the superpower on the world stage but iran is like when it comes to the middle east you have to recognize iran as a superpower that's their that's the argument so you, st you have to share the table with us and you have to take us seriously and, and they and one thing iran might have done the mid missed opportunity on it was obama was kind of doing that right mm -hmm. but uh, Iran, Iran's revolution is so anti-US. Every time, even it tries to get close to you, like, yeah, let's get talk to US. There's so many internal forces that are like, what the fuck is happening? That it, they have wow. to they have to pull back a little bit. It's I mean, actually, this goes back to a question that Moose is like, who are the good guys in the Middle East? Turkey? Well, definitely not Turkey. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but no, not Turkey. But not. The thing is that it's not that simple. Moves. There are different, there are different yeah. interests. There are different groups within each one of these countries. There are different people, elements. You, you can't make blanket statements about these countries like this. You have to take, you have to figure out who is doing what for what reason and what what can I do to either encourage them to move in my direction or discourage them. To make this play against me, it's it's now, way more complicated than. I just want yeah. to say that um, I'm first and foremost I'm a humanist. I'm an internationalist. I, yeah. you know, if if borders, I don't really believe sort of in the, the concept of hard borders. A lot of these actors, so, so these are called countries like um, Iraq, Syria, blah blah blah, United States, and so forth. All these nation states, they want to maintain their borders and border security. And they forsake their humanity sometimes when doing this in the pursuant, you know, in the pursuit of um, national security interest or in, if you will, regime. Oh, you're not going to be very popular if you make that argument. I no, know that. No. That's yeah. The... <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, the thing is, is that I, I'm honestly. I borders are sacred for these nationalist people. Borders are sacred. I, I'm actually, I wouldn't mind, I want the Kurds, for example, for the Kurds, I support their, as I mentioned, their right to self-determination, all these kind of things, but I would never support the Kurds becoming their own, like, you know, tyrannical force of, you know, oppressing other minorities and that. I want but that's to what's going to happen, isn't it? I, isn't that what's going to happen if they come in power? Well, the thing is, is that it's, this is, again, the Kurds aren't monolithic, as I think we all know this by now. But in the place like Iraq, Kurdistan, the reason why, when, as I mentioned before, the referendum failed is because of the tribalism, because of the families who are all went to try and hold their power against the normal people of Iraq and Kurdistan. It's a different story in north northern um, Syria as with um, the Syrian Democratic Forces and Rojava, where the people are actually much more of a bottom-up thing rather than a top-down thing, where more people are actually, you know, for a large part, a lot of them are coexisting with one another. They're trying to live, and they, they don't necessarily want independence. They just want the recognition of being able to teach their own language, being able to hold their own culture, being able to have their own rights, the democratic votes. They want feminists. But right part of that will involve anti Arabization that Saddam did and pushing back no, on. That, I'm talking, this is more about Syria, but within the case of Iraq and Kurdistan, a big thing. Well, was, anywhere, anti Arabization becomes yeah. a major part of that. Identity. I mean, if you look at the Syrian Democratic Force, their main philosophy is um, pluralism and multi-ethnic multi coalition, where it's trying to undermine the Arabization of the region to try and give it to more of the locals like the uh, Syriacs. For example, on that flag, you know, you can probably see three languages. The first is Arabic, of course. Second is Kurdish, or, um, you know, it's a, what's, what's it? Uh, 
Hazan Surya Demokratik. And the last one is Syriac or Aramaic, if I'm correct. It's sort of like an old um, language. That language has, is one of the few places that that language be, is being taught is in Rojava, in northern Syria. It had been banned under the Ba'athist regime. And what they're doing, in a sense, is that they're trying to help these smaller minorities. They want not only get their own rights, but they're helping, you know, together to try to bring up these other minorities. So it's not just Arabization or not just Kurdification. It's, you know, a multi-pluralistic society that they're trying to create. Right. By the way, um, I think we uh, let's do this one last question. I think we're going for. I think this is a good question to end it at because I think we went yeah. for a while. Um, yeah. So Moose is saying, I get it. I understand there are many terrorist groups in each country. The only thing uh, if is if we cannot figure out who the good guys are, America should get out of the Middle East. Um, I mean, here's the thing, though. If if the U.S. It, U.S. not intervening, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be intervention, okay? U.S. not intervening means somebody else is going to intervene, right? Um, and somebody else intervening would be Iran, Russia, China, every, I mean, every, I mean, it, the intervention is going to happen no matter what. Um, you might get a, you might not like the outcomes of no intervention. It might, the outcomes of no intervention could, could come and haunt you as much as or more or less than the outcomes of intervention. Um, yes. What you have to look for is what, if you have examples of bad interventions, I think the answer is not no intervention. The answer is learning from those mistakes and suggesting better types of more, more informed and better types of information intervention and and i think another answer is if you want better types of inf intervention you have to figure out um who are the influence makers um in when it comes to intervention policies um, um, policies in your country and the and the forces within your country that are uh, that are pushing for the interventions that are on the right side how could we make those groups more powerful right if you um and this is why I, when i mentioned intervention of groups that i uh I, it, the influence of groups that i don't like is not that i think we live in we we could be in a world that these groups don't these groups have in every country these groups have their influence and it's natural for these groups to have their influence and is the, the result is not to just call them evil because they they you can't assign morality to such machines right mm -hmm. what you have to do is figure out what how can i because you have to understand you know united states becoming this superpower because it's a superpower it will inevitably intervene okay any other superpower would have behaved um the same or more i mean any other superpower would have intervened it would be kind of naive to expect for a superpower not to intervene in other countries the, the question is, how can we influence? And I do think that you might have not liked it even more if Russia was today's superpower or even if China was today's superpower, right? Uh, I think yeah, the, sure. the type of intervention you might have gotten there would have been way worse. So I think, I think demanding no intervention is, is a lost cause. I, I think influencing the type of intervention that we want, especially if, as as human rights advocates, I know that in from the U.S. side, for example, for people that I listen to on, on Nightmare Fuel and uh, himself and other guests that he actually has, the uh, the priority is U.S. intentions and also human rights. But I think the main priority is U.S. In, uh, U.S. Um, not intention, U.S. interests. Um, but I think as, as, as for, for me, where my, my main interests are human rights, regardless of where people are from, um, and people that are like me see themselves as human rights activists, they have to find the interest, the, the interest groups within their country, um, that, that have those influences on their government um, that are human rights activists or become one yourself, right? Um, yeah. yeah, but what do you think? I mean, well, the thing is, is that, you know, 
just because the United States is not going to intervene, that doesn't mean that other countries will not intervene. Right. The fact of the matter is that the United States cannot go back to its position prior to World War One. It can't become a nation in isolation again. It's it's gone too far. It's too intertwined in other things. It has no choice but either to step up or be beaten down a bit more and more. The thing is, is that it will not entirely leave the area. It will always be there. What it needs to do is it should, for example, the reason why I support the Syrian Democratic Forces is because what they're doing on the ground, what they're doing to liberate people from ISIS, to liberate people from extremism, where you have liberal Muslims, Muslims who are not too fundamentalist, even though they may believe silly, they have this notion that, you know, they, they, they have a humanity. They believe in a humanist kind of notion, which I support. And that's why I have a flag of them in my room. That's why I support them. That's why I write about them is because of um, what do you want to say Eric? no 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 go ahead i'm oh, sorry it's because of what they're doing on the ground and what i believe their project is for and that's why i support them now if the united states abandons them then you know that to me one of the last straws for me of supporting the states as a you know good actor instead of a moral actor because i still believe the united states is a a good actor in large in sort of throughout history, if you will. But what's stopping me from claiming it's sort of an um, amoral actor is if it abandons these SDF and gives it over to the Islamists. Because if it does that, then I'll just I have to really have to say, you know, the United States is an amoral actor. It's it's everything's bullshit that it claims, and that you know it, it, may, it will make me very cynical. And I hope it doesn't do that. I hope that you know there's policymakers as well as people on the ground that they are modest on the ground in Syria who are very supportive of the Syrian Democratic Forces, who have formed relationships with these partners. These partners are the best we've had, sorry, the coalition, I should say, being countries against ISIS that we've had in decades. These people, despite all the things we've done, you know, not helping in Afrin, there's a lot of people who still support the United States and who still has good relationships with special operation forces and so on. Yeah, but it's smaller than ever. Yeah. It used to be great. Yeah, it, yeah, but uh, you know, and, and and you know, this is why I, d I don't actually know if we can I could call a, a government of a country moral or not. I I think it's kind of like a car, um, oh, or a I vehicle. See. Like I can't call this vehicle. Is this vehicle moral or not moral? I don't know. But you know, if you share the the driver, let's say, um, you have a. Uh, you have a ride share with a whole bunch of other people and who gets to drive at what time. It really depends on the driver, right? You know what I mean? Like, I really don't think uh, governments are... It doesn't make sense for me for to call, say if U.S. government is um, more moral or not moral. I, what, I, what I like about many countries is the fact that the influence of human rights group or human rights values yeah, is higher than other countries. And what I advocate for is increasing the influence of those of those kind of groups. Okay, then then I I sort of I also agree with, with that. I mean, I guess I support, if you will, the ideological support and the more the United States actually adhering to its own constitution and trying to promote the Bill of Rights to try and you know, spread this uh, ideology of uh, liberal democracy to the world. If it can do that, then I'm I'm support of it. But at the moment, it's always been the case that it seems since the cold war it's been more for keeping power balance than it is has been right for, you know. you're right see this actually that's a very good point united states needs an international branding and it, is, it needs to be consistent with that branding and this is what iran gets right right iran mm -hmm. is like we are your friendly anti-zionist uh, you know pro pro the, pro the oppressed um shia neighbor Right. Uh, and that's uh, our consistent brand. When people say that they're anti-Israel today and they all of a sudden playing footsies with Israel tomorrow, you can count on us for, for us to always be anti-Israel. When people are sub giving you guns today and they leave you to the dogs tomorrow, if we support you because we share same similar ideology, you can bank on us that we will always be there. So they have a consistent branding and people in the area that are aligning with Iran they could know they they have they know that they could rely on that uh, on you know it's kind of like a corporation that you could rely on right it's an insurance you know <laughs> you know I, I trust that brand I trust the Iran Velayat Faqih brand of Iran I trust it, right as a Shia right so you could back on that you know yeah. you're getting a lot of support um, 
with with Saudi Ari with uh, Saudi Arabia, um, I mean everything just fucking changed uh, <laughs> in the past year more than uh, their whole history. So they don't even don't themselves know what their branding is. Um, tomorrow there might be a fucking coup. Tomorrow somebody might be killing Ben Salman. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, they're, they're, you know, everything is changing there. Um, uh, so when it comes to um, Israel, the branding is consistent. Everybody knows. I mean, uh, but recently the religious groups in Israel are becoming more powerful. So the secular forces, I think, need to in Israel need to step up their games a little bit uh, if they don't want their government to get closer to become more religious because that's a huge right now big deal i think in israel but united states also doesn't have a uh, branding it's just its only game is military military uh play right and and there, it, it, if sometimes when it tries to pretend that it's branding is fighting for human rights people are like bullshit right because of the because of the record it has had uh, in the past uh, couple of years and i think that i think if you want if the best branding for united states that it needs to regain if it wants to become a major influence maker which i know it does um is is that we will fight for human rights we will fight for dissent uh, of the oppressed um we will we will fight for free speech everywhere mm -hmm all the time for everyone right um and we're going to be consistent with it and that's going to be a long time for it for that for people to believe that as, they used to though you there used to be a time with united states i mean when it comes to war against com communism that wasn't the branding the branding was communism uh, capitalism u.s mm -hmm. products u.s companies have a mcdonald's um american music um, all of that people are like yes, please. I want some of that, right? And that really worked. But now I think uh, that era is over. I think the branding should be: we will fight for human rights. And they're not doing that right now. I honestly think they're not. Um, I mean, I, I, this is why also the type of intervention, I, I the type of intervention that I think uh, United States has to have in Iran, but also in Saudi fucking Arabia is to, um, and other places is to, f is so, so much cheaper, uh, to do this type of inf intervention. And I think it will work right now. What Iranians need is access to easy access to dark, you know, encrypted, um, you know, fil anti filters or, or to, to the dark web or, or to, uh, changing their proxies using what is this called? Uh, virtual, virtual uh, bra VPN. uh, VPNs. Yes, um, you know, and they need to. They need to. Somebody needs to start developing these kinds of stuff. That's the. That's how you support dissent from within. But you need to make that available to everybody, so people, so that you're consistent with it. Um, and you need to. This takes. You could use a fraction of the money that you're spending on a lot of things to make this easy for even fucking 90-year-old uh, grandmas in Iran to be able to click a button and become invisible uh, to, to their government, right? Uh, if you could make technology like that for people to just download browsers for their internet and just as long as they're using this browser, uh, nobody's going to be able to see and maybe like some easy understanding ways to like don't put your name here, uh, don't uh, maximize the screen so that people can't even detect your fucking screen size, uh, don't ever mention where you are, don't mention your favorite color, don't use passwords as it's your birthday. Oh, oh, you just I just lost you for that. Hello, that was a bit strange. Yeah. <laughs> just like it just froze on me and then just like collapsed. <laughs> okay, as you were saying. But I'm just saying th this kind of intervention. First of all, right now, I think it needs to come from uh, maybe uh, private or um, other groups. But I think you know, United States needs to, you know, do this in, you know, in everywhere, like right? everywhere. Because if he only does it in Iran, it's not it's not the branding that is it's not going to have that branding power. Right. It needs to do that in 
even countries where it's considered it's considered a lot an ally and you know you don't you don't you could just make it have websites in this and websites for every country to be able to go and download these and this is another problem where i think the pc culture in the west is very destructive is because um and they, because this is the this is how us politics influences the world because when when <laughs> When when Silicon uh, Valley uh, values influences their and and the push by PC culture uh, makes companies like Facebook and Google and Twitter to look down, uh, try to um, attack hate speech. A lot of what's considered hate speech here against people that are considered minorities here are the same type of. Uh, talks that uh, that those same groups of people are actually the majority the oppressors in play in other countries you know what i mean like a lot of mm -hmm. anti-islam talk which in the west is considered um against minorities is the same kind of talk that minorities are using against an islamic majority oppressor and that kind of sensitive sensitivity to what's considered hate speech because of the leftists, uh, so, uh, PC leftist culture, it's going to make a lot of these tools like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter uh, as a weapon for these people against their own government, against their oppressors, it's going to make them less powerful weapons coming tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. I mean, there's so many videos that were uploaded in Syria that were taken down by YouTube, even though they were evidences of war crimes that needed to stay there uh, there were so many people that this uh, are you know they're pointing verses in the quran that is uh, anti-jewish or pointing out that even a mom somewhere said something anti uh, anti this group anti that group and they got banned from facebook because they, even though they weren't saying it themselves they were just pointing out that somebody is saying it so i do think these kinds of tools have become a, like Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and Telegram, and WhatsApp, and Instagram have become a huge, powerful tool. And trying to you, um, the fact that Facebook goes to Pakistan and tries to put blasphemy laws on Pakistan, uh, on, on Facebook in Pakistan, really shows that we're going in the opposite direction of what people on the ground yeah. need right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, when I come to when it comes to what should be done, I mean. I really do think that the United States should lead an act of reforming the United Nations because at the moment um, Saudi Arabia sits on the Human Rights Council, Iran's head of other stuff. It's just like it's becoming more dictatorship, you know, a club for dictators. And I think that you know, if the United States and this is this is, again, this won't happen for at least in the Trump era. It'll come after the Trump era, whoever comes after. Hopefully, you know, who's not a, a conservative like this. But it, it has there has to be a huge real ideological push for a more you know a liberal world if you will, like a more push in that direction because at the moment there's this and the united states is the only power that actually can do that but at the moment it's been led by conservative bodies who are not really interested necessarily in human rights or that they may support the kurds for example they may support like little groups here and there but it's more like tokenistic it's more like okay we're supporting them because they're means to an end which right. that, it, should, it shouldn't be about that. It should be if you if you have values. You know, you, the United States has a brilliant constitution, one of the best constitutions on earth. It has the Bill of yeah. Rights, constitution as well. If you just read those documents and you export the ideology from those documents, like Jefferson tried to do in the early eighteenth, um, yeah, early nineteenth century, if you can do that and export it against those more radical and more tyrannical regimes. Then you have really something. You have something, but you have to be dedicated to that project. And at the moment, there aren't any real politicians, or there aren't really like you know state mm -hmm. actors that can do that. The United States can do it, but it's being led by conservative power, which is the right. big problem. So it falls on us, like you know, people, you know, locals, to drive, create movements that support these kind of ideological right. things. I mean, Iran recognizes the the whole point of. Um, the whole power behind selling its ideology. And that's why the Iran protest was, even if it wasn't a threat to the government falling, it was such a big hit to Iran's image, which Iran yeah. needs to sell its ideology across the Middle East. So that's why even the, that's, that's 
even if the protests never lead to uh, any major government change, it does reduce the Iran's influence in the Middle East because they need that image. The, the PR, their PR is very important to them because they understand the value. Uh, and United States understood the value of selling the ideology when it was selling capitalism around the world. Uh, but it's not, it's not doing that right now. I mean, even Russia, um, you know what Russia was uh, uh, doing with, I don't know, bots and social media. Um, it, you know, you don't, when it comes to countries where or natural dissent exists, you don't even need bots. You just need to give people access, right? You just need to give. You're gonna have uh, You're gonna have much um, people. People that every each one of those people are way more effective than a thousand bots. The only thing you need to give them is the protection, the anonymity, and the access to internet that the technology that they need. And that's that's basically, you know, going to your enemy and just fighting it from within. But the thing is that 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 fight from within will never be welcomed if it's selective. It needs to be across the board. It needs to be consistent. It needs to be part of your branding that you sell to the yeah, world. It's, if you, it's, yeah. it's I know that branding is important, but there's also uh, arguably I mean I have to give this point sort of as a, a criticism or counterpoint, if you will, to what we've been talking about. There is sort of a realist you know element to it because you know, ultimately things cost money and resources and certain things can only be invested in cer at certain times. So you have to use certain allies, but keeping that realist element, I do think there needs to be a more, more, you know, moral element as well. Cause you know, it's that balance. I understand that you have to balance these two, but I often at times, no, I, don't see think, I don't think it's a balance. I think that for people that are most, because as, as human rights advocates, we care, we are caring about the human rights issues, but yeah. the people are saying, no, you have to be pragmatic and you have to be realist. Actually, I think liberal hawk right now is lifetime is making that point. I think, um, yeah. but I think that, uh, but what as human rights advocates, when we go to people that national interest is their highest priority, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to argue with them is that this moral consistency and this branding is actually serves their national interest. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like yeah, even. Even from a pragmatic way, you will be, because you will be more effective with with your intervention if you have a consistent branding. Because, and this is what some other countries like Iran recognize, support on the ground matters. Support if without support on the ground, you are liberal. Hawk is saying I agree with you. I don't know if he's telling me uh, or or to to lose. Um, support on the ground is the difference between whether your solution is a short-term solution or if it's a long-term solution, right? And if it's a short-term solution, it usually, once the short-term solution is over, you usually end up in a worse situation than you started. You, that's why I think support on the ground matters for your intervention. Yeah. yeah. But what anything, any, oh, so should we end it there? Sorry, I think this um, went longer. Did I talk over you too much? No, no, you were you were fine. I mean, I, I, think... I, I thought this, I, I thought this fine. Like I'm, I was, I, I, I don't know if I want to sort of explain the first groups in Syria, for example. But I think that'll be a bit too, too long to sort of I, I explain the first groups because when it comes to the Syrian conflict, there are so many groups. Yes. I'm just like, you know, fuck it. <laughs> different ones. And you, I usually, it usually takes one of okay. Yeah, one of the people in your group to go and pick up an ISIS flag and somebody to take a picture of your members of your group with that ISIS flag are like, yeah. oh, that's, that, that, here, there's the end of this. Done. Done. This group. Yeah. This group um, forget Western support. Forget everything. We've, we have yeah. a picture of one of your members uh, with an ISIS. This is why it's so hard. This is why uh, U.S. having is such a hard time to find any groups because any any connection because it's easy sometimes to point somebody in your group that has some connection to somebody that is uh, semi Al Qaeda or branch of Al Qaeda or semi ISIS or a branch a new branch of ISIS. And once you do that, then that's the end of your. That's in the Western support for your group, no? I mean, lo the large part, the reason why um, they stopped their CIA program to um, the FSA 
Free Syrian Army was because a lot of the weapons that they were giving funding to were actually fallen in the hands of Islamists from Al Nusra and Ara al Shah. And because of that, um, the United States said, okay, if you guys aren't fighting ISIS, we've given you the weapons to fight ISIS kind of thing, and we've given you the weapons sort of to try and make a, a strong opposition, and you guys aren't doing that. Okay, we're going to stop that funding. We're going to give the weapons to sort of the Syrian Democratic Forces, which are fighting ISIS. Which is why the United States still supports them, is because they're the one, the one of the strongest players against ISIS. But that's not a long-term strategy. There has to be a long-term strategy, and that's the problems that the United States has always. It seems to it's having that thing of short-term strategy, at least from its its uh, appearance. And it's a short-term strategy with fighting ISIS only. Right. Uh -uh. And yeah, actually, and uh, one last point um, is that the the the, the power with uh, such strong ideologies is that it makes people think long term more than short term. Because when it comes to um, when people when you don't have such branding, then the senator, the lobbyist, the mm -hmm. voter, everybody is thinking about the next two or four years, right? Um, and when it comes to having a consistent ideology or set of value system that you're going to adhere to, it forces you to think long term. It forces you to be consistent. Yeah. Um, Moose is asking, Army, Armin, are you for military intervention? I am for no military interjection at all. My, Moose, I'm saying I'm not for either one of those. It depends on the situation. I don't think you can make a blanket statement. I think you have to evaluate each situation um independently gene is asking armin can you post a link in twitter every time you are going to have a live stream i did it's, it's, it, but this one was uh, i did it was on atheist republic and then i, I the, the armin page more she's talking about I don't know, oh yeah armin. oh yeah <laughs> my i retweeted it okay uh support no, jihad wait. to own the live well, this is liberal hockey saying support jihad to own the He's lib. joking. Yeah. I know he's joking, but but in serious no, that's what that's what the secular jihadist podcast is for, right? I don't know if you guys, if you guys listen to the secular jihadist, you know, talking talking about an ideological battle, check uh, when it comes to in the Middle East, if, this is why you guys should support the secular jihadist podcast. Uh, it's it's myself and Ali Rizwi. Uh, two ex-Muslims, uh, one from Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. He's, he was in both. One from Iran, and we are um, we have the Secular Judges podcast, and we get shit ton of downloads from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, oh. from Pakistan, um, and that's that's what I'm. That's part of the ideological battle that we're fighting. Uh, so yeah, check out the Secular Judges. Uh, I, I just want to say that. Um, in it doesn't necessarily have to be military. It can also be diplomatic in intervention, humanitarian intervention. There's different forms of intervention, and you can sometimes have both, or sometimes one, or you know, just just to make sure that people don't realize that it's just you know, intervention is so simple a term. It's quite complex, actually. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. When whenever people hear intervention, they think like mm -hmm. planes dropping bombs. Yeah, uh, that's what, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, but. Um, but no, intervention takes a lot of forms. Um, oh, Jindi is saying, Jindi actually is from Saudi Arabia. I think she or he is in Saudi Arabia right now. Uh, I think, well, right? Cool. I think. I, <laughs> and she she mentioned that she she have watched all the Secular Jihadist podcasts. Wow, that's, such, that's great. Uh -huh. That's very sweet. Thank you. We, we appreciate your support. And to people that use the Super Chat today, I can't believe this is the highest number of... I need, when I, if I ever see you, Anthony, uh, where are you right? Are you, you're, in, you're in... I'm in Queensland, um, in northeast of Australia. Okay. If I ever see you, I'm going to have to... Uh, dinner or lunch is on me because it's so... Because okay. <laughs> Come to Cairns. It's a beautiful area. Yeah. <laughs> But thank you for everybody that uh, uh, was here. Thank you, Mo Moose, Brian, Beach, uh, Gene, for the super chats. That's so generous. Jeremy left because it was left, but he also used the super chat. Mike also. Gene uses super chat twice. Very generous. Um, oh, Gene is a cis male of color. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, uh, Jean, um, let me know if you the, the contacted me. Liberal Hawk is saying, great talk, guys. 
uh, you yourself as well liberal he liberal hawk was in that live chat with you and yeah. Um, Therese, yeah i enjoy yeah. your comments as well um he's he's, he's my classic neocon he wants to <laughs> dominate the world and destroy yeah. <laughs> no, I like his comments. Uh, um, yeah, and also shout out to uh, uh, Nightmare Fuel. Does he prefer to be called Nightmare Fuel or Reese? Uh, we just call him Reese because that's his first really? name. Well, shout out to him, and I really appreciate. Even when I disagree with him, I I'm really glad that I I subscribe to subscribe to him. I really think that he's a he is he needs more followers because he's and I think the main. Uh, YouTuber main voice against the the cancer that is atheists uh, is the atheists that are supporting religion in our community and the fact that he's going out and calling it out um, is such a big service and I, I and if it wasn't for him I would have never I, I would have always called it out as bullshit but I would have never known how big of a fucking mess that is. Um, I mean, it was it became very apparent to me after Jordan Peterson uh, and the support, the amount of support that he got from atheists uh, yeah. uh, for his for I mean, for his, a lot of a yeah. lot of people um, don't realize just because you become an atheist doesn't mean that you're going to be a liberal free thinker. Some atheists are conservative. It's actually surprising a lot of conservative atheists. In, no, no, conservative, conservative. I could, I, I mean, conservative. I, I mean, I myself, I'm a liberal. But conservative, I get why some atheism has nothing to yeah. do with being conservative, yeah, yeah, yeah. liberal. But but yeah. what I don't, what I what I hate when it comes to atheists is not just conservatives, the ones that make up because you can be conservative and non-religious. Yeah. Uh, what I what I was always fighting within the ex-Muslim community is ex-Muslims that support Islamic reform because now they're selling religion as well. But now I'm also introduced to basically. I think Jordan Peterson is the Majid Nawaz of of the uh, atheist, <laughs> ex, ex, ex Christian atheists, um, wow. which is like, hey, they're saying, hey, there's like some people from are telling ex Muslims that there's hate, there's hope for Islam, and I'm telling them no, there isn't. Uh, and I think what Jordan Peterson is doing is giving is big is trying to make the Bible relevant to atheists um and the bible is dying i mean i think christianity is dying a slow death and people like jordan peterson are making that death a little bit slower but i'm hoping just a little bit um i do think christianity as a as a influence maker as as an influence as an ideology in the next 10 years is going to be very low i think the main forces when it comes to ideology in the world in 10 years from now are going to be uh, Islam, um, atheism, or and or secularism, um, and uh, ethno nationalism. I think these are the main forces that are going to be fighting each fighting for influence uh, ten years from. I don't think Christianity is going to be a serious play. And when I say ethno nationalism, I don't just mean just uh, the white ethno nationalism. I also I, I'm also including Hindu ethno nationalism. Uh, and to yeah. a smaller degree, uh, Iranian, uh, um, Aryan ethno nationalism as well. Well, but the thing about know. nationalism, it's actually quite a, um, even though technically ever since sort of the Enlightenment era has been kind of there, but nationalism has really got popular in the 20th century and even the modern century because people having their own states is a very appealing thing. And some groups, like, for example, the Kurds and um, Arabs for a long time. I mean, the Arabs, for example, had Iraq and they had a, a pan-Arab ideology of Baathism, which is Arab nationalism, yeah. essentially Arab national socialism, <laughs> if you want to, in the Middle East. Yeah, but that never worked out. Um, yeah, never worked out. Gene D is asking, why is why is Faisal not in the secular jihadists anymore? Um, I think um, he was, he, it was a combination of the fact that he was busy, but also I think he found our content a little bit too controversial um for his taste yeah, that's so that's why but anyways this is why it's great to have lots of small donors instead of one major big donors because you don't have to you can say whatever you want and you know your fans are going to support you uh, and mm -hmm. if some people leave it's not going to completely destroy the you know you're not going to have to pay out of pocket for all the expenses um, mm -hmm. We do have a lot of Atheist Republic does hire a lot of people 
uh, from Philippines. Uh, we do um, we do have a lot of expense. So if you guys want to sub, and we do have a lot of hosting expenses, video expenses, sound expenses. So if you guys want to support Atheist Republic, uh, go to atheistrepublic.com, click on support. We just recently opened, also opened a Patreon account, so you could go to Patreon and search for Atheist Republic. I'll try. You know what's up? I want to quickly sort of say something. Um, first time I came upon Atheist Republic was probably in 2013. And so um, at the time, I never knew 2015, 2016, maybe 2016, I don't know. One of those um, years I came across it. I think I did send you actually one of my pieces, uh, uh, was Letters to Concern Free Think, because I did, I did used to write in a little blog that I had before I went into politics. Sometimes it's a bit cringy, especially when you're like in your 16, 17, 18 to see your writing in that. But um, I remember sending something to you in 2006, I believe. There's concern for you, think. I don't know if it's if you guys ever got a response from that. But um, well, <laughs> we, we weren't as organized. We used to work on volunteers with volunteers. Oh, I see. But now, so we were all over the place, and volunteers, you know, they they try they try to help as much as they can, but yeah, they sure. they but they but they're busy people. They have their jobs. Mm -hmm. But now we have actually. We hire. We have a, a staff, so I'm hoping that we are now not missing anything anymore. Um, is um, so. So we do. We do have a lot of the work is done by hired staff now instead of just volunteers. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've largely sort of moved on from that aspect because it eventually gets. You know, once you talk about um, philosophy and sometimes and religious criticism, it kind of sometimes get dry and you kind of feel a bit boring. What? And I sort of moved on. Well, we don't we don't just talk about atheists. We talk about I mean, this is an of atheist course. republic. This is not the bad. What what we tell people is atheist republic is a community for atheists, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's not just about atheism alone. Yeah, I, I know. I found that out later, and so I, I moved on to just what I said. That's why I'm now more focused on the international, you know, conflicts and that kind of stuff as my interest field, as opposed to philosophy, which I did a couple of years. I still do write small things, but just like it's not something I'm passionate anymore. To, little bit from right yeah <laughs> yeah no i mean i mean there's uh, i'm interested in geopolitics as well a lot um but so, some people do complain when we post something that is not religion or atheism related uh, and like yeah. what does it got to do with atheism and then what sometimes <laughs> when we post a lot about religion and like oh always about religion can we can do you have do you have anything else to talk about no, you, you know you're screwed either way <laughs> <laughs> Hey, the post right before this one was about something else, and there was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, oh, atheists can't talk about anything other than religion, but then you know, so I don't know what to do because like, what do you guys want? But the thing is I that mean, you're screwed either way. <laughs> but we try to we try to basic. I mean, we, we try to tell people like, we, obviously, atheists getting together. One of the main topics is going to be religion. But it doesn't have to be the only topic. We do have other interests. We don't agree with each other. It's good to see. The, I mean, is once you get a lot of people that are atheists in a room together, it's good to see what we disagree on, not what we agree on, right? Anyways. So I mean, that, that, that that's just all about encouraging civil discussion, right. talking about a variety of different issues. I mean, that's how you. It's being atheist doesn't mean just oh, just I must I don't believe in God, therefore now I've got to follow science or you know worship a Dawkins. It's more about you know different ideas because I, atheists are so varied. They come from a variety yeah. of different places. They're beautiful people. Some are ugly people. You know, it, it, the people. Yeah. Yeah, and so even uh, the, the thing is that what I think the difference between the atheist movement movements. Okay, people don't crucify me because they, well, there's not one movement I know. Okay, uh, the atheist movements to the skeptic movement and the humanist movement is that they, there's some overlap. But I think the atheist movement, and again, this is an atheist movement. I'm not defining atheism. I know atheism is nothing other than a lack of God, but the atheist yeah. movement is more than that. The atheist movement, I think, is is about providing a community for atheists, even the ones that we think are may, might not be humanists, might not be skeptic. The reason why the atheist community exists is that we think that people that are atheists shouldn't be discriminated against. They shouldn't feel alone. They shouldn't feel isolated. We should... They should feel like, wow, there's so many of us out there. I'm not alone. It's not bizarre. I shouldn't be ashamed. I shouldn't hide. So that's um, that's what the atheist community is for, to provide community and protection for atheists, right? There is some overlap with skeptic, skeptic movement and the humanist movement, 
but it's a little bit different. Liberal Hawk was mentioning a, a, we, Atheist Republic should be like, um, to say that we're going to take over, atheism should take over the world, atheistic geopolitics. <laughs> But to, to be, to, I, but I, I, let me be serious with you. Some people uh, message us, uh, serious people emailed us and like, wait, so if, if it's, do we have a land somewhere um, that is an <laughs> and I And I said, no, it's just a virtual republic. And they're like, have you considered getting an island? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like, no, I don't think that's possible. It's safe uh, like, <laughs> and the people are like, because if you do, I will definitely move there. <laughs> like, I'm like, no, I, it's, this is not a real country. Okay, this is yeah, a but I, movement. I'd yeah. say it's, um, it's. But they're really saying that people. Thing. Yeah, go on, go on. Sorry. Sorry, I just want to quickly say that you know it's a really, really good thing what you guys are doing because. I remember when I first like actually acknowledged the term atheist, you know, where I now wear it, you know, nonchalantly because it's like, you know, it's a, I'm an atheist, you know, big deal kind of thing. But I remember when I first was reading about, you know, um, this thinkers, philosophers and that, it was a big deal because, you know, in the community I came from, the term was very toxic because it meant something, you know, you know, hostile on that. So it's when you come to know that there's more people who are atheists who actually, you know, who don't really if you talk about these things, it actually was very positive for me at the time, especially when I was a younger person. But now that I'm like 21, I've sort of I've gone past that. But I I always yeah. am very grateful for these kind of communities because there are people right. out there who don't feel that this place they belong or something, a place they can go to talk about these. Things. Exactly, it's kind of like the gay rights movement, right? Just because yeah. you have a gay rights movement, that doesn't mean you're changing the definition of what it means to be gay. Exactly. That doesn't mean that all gays agree with each other. <laughs> that means all gays are in the same political party. Uh, no, it just means that you think people shouldn't be discriminated against because they're gay, and because you mm -hmm. think that uh, gay people is you you can provide community and for gay people and for them to see that there's a lot of them out there and there's they're not weird, they're not something to be yeah. uh, that they need to hide. And the thing is that you might at first you might get involved with the gay community mm -hmm. but at some mm -hmm. point you might be so comfortable and have other passions that you move on but you're glad that the gay rights movement was there for you and you wanted you wanted to stay there for other people that find that that want to know that um there's a lot of people like them out there but maybe you will move on anyways let's mm -hmm. uh finish this yeah sure sure <laughs> <laughs> we've been going on for quite some time <laughs> yeah yeah thank you everybody thank you guys um and yeah so mm -hmm. let, let us know in the comment section what other topics you want us to address for other atheist republic discussions and also please subscribe to the youtube uh, uh to, to our youtube channel and mm -hmm. leave a like and if you want to support us either share this video or become a patron we will we will have some special one-on-one -on -one time with our rewards once we hit a certain number and yeah we sh we d we do have a lot of people that support us on paypal but P patron uh, is going to be a way for us to be able to um, give special access or special rewards to our to people that support us um gene d is saying i can listen to this forever <laughs> yeah and i can talk forever but my wife is not going to be very happy <laughs> <laughs> all right all right all right thank you anthony thank you so i took so much of your time i really um, no, 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 no worries. You know, the thing about this is I enjoy these kind of discussions. I mean, I was supposed to be on at a tutorial an hour ago, but I'm, oh I'm, my I'm, God, I'm fine. so sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I, I'm completely fine with it. I've re I, I already emailed in this case, like I always email my lecturers saying that I won't be available. So I'm fine with it. So they know I'm a hard worker because I'm like, I, I'm more of a distinction, hard distinction kind of hard work when it comes to law and politics, but that's another issue. But if anyone wants to read my stuff, just go to the region. I'll oh, give yeah, a link. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask you. Sorry. I, I knew I was going to forget. Oh, okay, no, no. Let's pretend. Let's pretend I didn't forget, okay? By the way, Anthony, <laughs> before you go, <laughs> yeah. before you go, can you tell people where they can find you? Sorry. <laughs> okay. So if oh, people want to find me, they can find me too. So they can find me on Facebook at they can find me at Twitter at Stoke Viper. Wait, you, um, you got cut. You got cut for the first. For, where was the first place they could find you? Sorry, the place that they can find me is at Facebook. They can message me on the, um, the Facebook page. They have. I don't really work at that much, but it's Anthony Abuse to be Song. They can add me on Facebook if they want to. Um, they can find me at Twitter, which is where I'm mostly active, at the handle Stoke Viper. 
which I, of course I'll give the links to Armin in the description. Yep. And if they want to read any of my writing for ARIA magazine, um, I've written uh, two pieces of ARIA magazine. I've written for the region, which deals with Middle Eastern politics and that. And I have my own blog called um, philosophyismagic.com, which I used to post, but I don't post this often because I've got university work, so I do whatever I can in my free time. And sometimes I don't have free time. I know I may stuff around on Twitter at times, but I, most of the times I'm doing that while I'm working kind of thing. So multitasking. <laughs> so I'll give all these links to Armin. And uh, if you want, I do have a huge sort of used to use. It's Anthony of used to this on as well, but it's it's something I used to upload. I only have two videos, I think maybe two videos. And that's pretty much it. But it's not something I I'm not a YouTuber, I'm more of a writer. And I occasionally do podcasts like this. You should do YouTube. People would love it. Uh, I, I need the time and I need to you know, it seems hard stuff and at times I don't have really the energy or the will to do that kind of stuff. Uh, Moose, is, Moose is saying, I wish I could find more atheists in my community. I sent you a link to Atheist Republic. We have uh, consulates in most major cities or a city close to you. So you could find atheists close to you. It's an Atheist Republic resources, then meet atheists in your city. Um, thanks. And Moose also saying thanks for this lovely channel. Also, please go and I will, I will, once I get the links from Anthony, I'm going to yeah. uh, include them in the uh, description. Uh, go check them out. Uh, follow him on Twitter and like his page. I'm gonna add you on Facebook, by the way, if you don't mind. Uh, I've already you've already added me, Armin. Oh, I have. Okay. Yeah, I've known you for a while. I'm already. No, I I follow you on Twitter mostly. I see you on. Yeah, I mean, I know I'm friends with you, and I don't know if I'm friends with your wife necessarily. I, I have just... I have accepted more uh, <laughs> like five thousand on Facebook. I don't know. I don't, don't worry, don't worry. I mean, yeah. uh, you probably will see me if you type in Anthony of to be song. I'll come up as your friends. No, yeah, no. I, 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 I didn't really know you until I saw you on. I mean, I didn't really know what the gym, yeah, your views are until I saw you on and and night uh, yeah. field and Reese. So thank you, Reese, for introducing me to Anthony. He's a. Uh, um, I'm glad that you're. I'm glad that you're sharing your opinions because it's. it's you have a lot of local knowledge. You lot of. In, yeah, in, yeah. I mean, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a passion project for me because I've, I've I love sort of the Kurds. And I support the different ideological struggles that they've been going on, and it's just it's a particular interest of mine that I've had for quite some time. And I, it took me two years, by the way, just to learn the acronyms. So if you're confused with the acronyms, it took me two years to master the acronyms like PKK. <laughs> <laughs> takes a while. Yeah. Just, just draw a map and put the each acronym on the specific. I actually I could do that, but I've got to first find a big enough map and a you know, big enough. Can you actually make a YouTube video explaining the cards? Uh, if I've got time, yeah, maybe just remind me, put a note somewhere. Yeah. Like Anthony, when you got time, do this. And so yeah, the science and stuff and the exams coming up, which is yeah, yeah. my priority. All right, man. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'll send you the send me the links. I'll include yeah. the um, I'll include in the description, and I will also have to design a, a, a thumbnail for this and everything. Then I'll post. The, I'll share the link on social media. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, man. Okay. Talk to you later. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye.